Welcome to this free Unity 2D Beginners course. During this 8 hour tutorial, you will be learning all the basics of Unity. If you would like to learn everything about this program and design 2D games like a pro, head to skillademia.com and get access to the full course. Now, let's begin. Hi, Stefan here. Welcome to Unity. Now, this is an introduction and a brief outline of this course. While we are centered in Unity 2D, the notions learned and the logical structure should be applied in a variety of fields and also including Unity 3D. The first few steps would be to take an overall look at our editor, Unity, and play around. See what is what and where. Then we will deepen studying the basics of the for loops and the if statements. By the end of this practice, we would have created an application with two functions that will be decorated with some looping lights. At this stage, we should be more comfortable with the overall feeling inside Unity, as well as creating a scene, a script and prefabs, for example. Next, we will move towards the rotations and movement part. By the end of this part, we would have created a simple two-player spawn game. We will use both keyboard and mouse in order to execute our inputs. This chapter should lead us into the next one, which treats of creating a more complex 2D game. Here we shall start with the basics of animations, including sprite sequences, sprite sheets, a rigging and skinning editor, and Unity's own animator. We will also talk about the creation of assets, images, sounds, animations, effects, and so on. Then we'll delve into the depths of a rigid body 2D, and this chapter will be the most extensive one. After finishing this chapter, we should have completed a 2D platformer building kit which will allow you to create the game you'd like. Further on, we shall exercise the same notions but placed in a different structure while building a 2D card game where we'll have to find the corresponding pairs. Last but not least, we shall have an introduction to mobile development and more precisely mobile inputs. With the notions learned, it should be easier for you to investigate further on and create more complicated apps and games, both for computers and mobile devices. To quote one of my favorite characters, let's start at the beginning. So let's, let's proceed with installing Unity. We shall go to unity.com and please uh, feel free to explore the web page. However, what we are interested in right now, it's all the way down to the bottom and uh, get Unity. We are going to use the Unity Hub in order to install it. So in my case, I'm going to download it for Windows. We do have to agree. The installation itself is pretty intuitive, but uh, I want to do this uh, with you in order to point, uh, point out some things. So we will run Unity Hub. Allow access. Okay, so this is what I'd like to... Actually, no, I'm, I'm going to skip installation. I'd like to point out something else first. So what we are interested in... Uh, are the long-term support releases because they uh, they should be more stable. So in our case, in my case, the last uh, release is this one on the 24th of February. And uh, I actually advise everybody to download the same version. And we are going to use Unity Hub to download it. Open. And yes, I've lost, I would like to install the Visual Studio, Android build support, both of them. Yes, iOS as well. And Windows build support as well. And sure, let's install the documentation, why not? Uh, in your case, if you'd like to test or maybe 
build applications for Linux or Mac, please feel free to, to install that as well. Okay, and we should continue. Yes, I have read them before. Yes. Um, all right, so this should be about it. Well, I will see you once the, the download have finished. Hello, welcome to part two of installing Unity. So everything downloaded and uh, also another window opened in the meanwhile and I had to accept everything in order to install Microsoft Visual Studio, which will be our script editor. Now, uh, Unity installed uh, in your local drive, in my case C, and it automatically created a folder and named the version. So this would be the editor that we are going to use. I'm not going to change the name. If I would like to install another version, then another folder would automatically be created here. And this is a good thing because in older versions of a Unity Hub, uh, this would not work and we would have to rename them manually. Uh, okay, back to our install. So I would like to check if, if uh, Visual Studio is, if Microsoft Visual Studio is correctly correlated with the Unity engine. So for that, we are going to create a, a project. I already created one because the first time you're going to run it, it's going to, to take a while, maybe between two to four minutes. So I actually also created a folder on my desktop called Unity Projects. And uh, I clicked new project, my project name. In my case, I named it test project. And uh, I selected the folder of my liking. Okay. And uh, I press created project. But oh, actually, first of all, I selected 2D because we are going to do it in 2D. Later on, in our next video, we are going to open two projects, one 2D, one 3D to see them in detail. So yes, I selected 2D, entered the name, chose the location, and I pressed created project. I'm going to press cancel now because I already created it. And this window opened. So. Uh, I'm not going to uh, explain in detail right now the windows. Let's try and simply right click here as I'm where I'm clicking in our project tab and uh, click create and a C sharp script. So test script. And now when I'm going to click it also Visual Studio will open for the first time and it should actually take a while. But while we do have a, a very powerful tool, Unity Engine, our most powerful tools would be patience and investigation. Because many times I think um, we would do the same thing and actually not many times, but sometimes doing the, precisely the same thing and getting different results. I think uh, is what Einstein called that insanity, but, but it does happen in computer science. Okay, so it took less than I was expecting. Okay. Yes, it opened it finally. So yes, I think it's correlated. One more thing to just to make sure. I think we could go in preferences and in external tools, the external script editor. Yes, it should appear here. So, well, I think we we are all set up to to start uh, to start our course. Uh, okay, see you in the new, in the next video. I went and created uh, two projects, one 2D and one 3D. I pressed create new project. I selected for the 3D one, I selected 3D core, named it accordingly, and for the 2D one, I selected 2D core, named it accordingly, and created project. So now I have them both opened in two Unity instances. It's a good thing that we can run multiple instances of Unity. So I'll start with a 2D one. Now, this window here, it's the hierarchy window, and uh, this would be all the objects that we do have in our scene. A scene is, to take it for example, a level, a level of a game, that would be a scene, and another level, well, would be another scene. By default, the, the 2D scene comes only with a main, with a camera, which it's, yeah, it's called main camera. Uh, 
and so yes in the hierarchy all of we can find all the things that we do create in our scene now in the scene tab we can see a graphic interpretation of what we created and move them pan the scene rotate and organize the scene as we would like to now the next tab would be the game tab and uh, this is what the player actually gets to see so we could actually choose multiple resolutions or whichever resolution we would like but I prefer to keep it on this one 16.9 because uh, this is the full HD uh, structure aspect okay now in the inspector whatever we click on the scene uh, main camera we can see its properties and its components and we can alter them in the inspector the next window would be the project window and uh, I think it comes by default like this and uh, well this is where we can actually drag folders, images, textures, sounds, create scripts, uh, whatever. This is where we can visualize them and organize them together. Uh, now, I am missing some windows which I do like to have. So, I do like to have a lighting window and we can find it in Window, Rendering, Lighting. Now, I would like to dock it here, actually. Yes. So, this is a... Uh, this is a layout I like. And we can actually save our layout. I, had, I already saved it earlier. It's called My Layout. So, save. Yes. So, for example, if we... Let's say we mess the windows up and we make a whole bunch of things here we can just go to my layout and it will bring it back the way we want it to i would actually like to add another window here which are go we are going to use further on and in animation animator and this is set by default where i want it to um all right so this would be a general description of a default 2d scene let's see the 3d scene now the 3d scene comes by default with a main camera as well and a directional light and all the other windows are the same it's nothing different we only think for example in uh, our lighting window the environment is set to a default skybox but uh, you, you don't need to worry to, to worry about this uh, okay so back to our 2d project let's uh, go ahead and create something i will create in 2d it's, it's good practice to work with quads because they handle sprites very well and uh, this is just a default thing for 2d to work with quads so a quad it comes as a small square I won't change the name now one thing that is important and we should do in all in all of our projects at least at the very beginning is to change the lighting the ambient color to white and now we can see our quad properly so always when we start a project we should go to lightning environment and change the ambient color to white so we can properly see our colors and our objects so i'm on the lighting tab i will click in the inspector tab and click on the quad so let's analyze this object this square it has a transform component this is its main position this is its position and rotation and scale as you can see now i would like to place it at zero 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 so it's right in the middle of everything so it has a transform component it also has a mesh this would be another rendering component and we can see it as a quad and a mesh renderer which 
it always carries a default material which actually gives its color white in our case by default and it also comes in with a collider uh, okay for now if I press the W key and you can see we selected the moving arrow here so yes it, it does what what it says I can move it on the X axis the red one it's always the X axis and the Y axis it's the yellow one uh, why am I telling uh, all this because the main difference and some things are better to understood in 3d we are not using I'm going to create something in uh, in the 3d project as well so I will create a cube okay and I can see it here now if if I will press W again we can see all the three axes so in the 2d we only are not we I we are not working with the z-axis this is our you know, the most impactant thing that we need to understand however we will rotate on the z-axis actually we will, m most of the games only rotate in 2d only rotate on the z-axis so i'm telling you all of this because it's i think it would be good practice to learn it from early on uh, because we are going to use some formulas that involve 3D movement, however, only applied to 2D. So, uh, having got rid of, of this detail, I'm going to close the 3D project. I don't want to save it. And uh, let's go back to our 2D project. Let's go to the, to the tools. Up here on the upper left, we do have, this would be simply panning. This would be the moving tool which we went over the rotation tool and as I told you we are only rotating on the z-axis which is reflected here if I would rotate on the x or y axis uh, maybe sometimes this would be something we would be looking for but uh, not normally or at least not for the games I, I have programmed uh, for us to design and we do have a scale tool Oh, another important thing. Uh, this is also a skill to but a skill to but allows me slightly different to use it and scale it. And this is yet another scale tool. Now, uh, what is important here and I usually work like this in pivot and center. If I would uh, if I would be I'm going to back to the move tool. If I would select here instead of pivot center, okay, instead of local, I would select globally. It it makes reference to the world axis, and uh, we are going to to talk a lot about that. So the world axis it never change. The x is x and the y is y. But as I rotate my object, well, it's own axis do change all right so I think this would be a very first uh, touch with unity to put it so try creating uh, some objects and rotate them and place them together both in a 2d or 3d whichever your your preference would be and uh, I will see you in the next video where we, we will create our first script. Alright, so picking up from where we left off, uh, we created a quad. In case you are starting a new project, please don't forget to go in inside the lighting tab, select environment, and then change the ambient color to white, so we can proper properly see the colors. So we created a quad and with W. It's a shortcut to move it. Whoops, I selected the quad. W with E to rotate it, R to scale it. Now with T is the other type of scale, the rec tool. This is very useful when uh, building uh, user interfaces. And the other tool, it's actually a hole in all tool, but uh, I, due to precision, I never actually got to use it or very, very rarely. 
maybe if I'm mistaken. Uh, but by default, W, E, R are the shortcuts to move, rotate, scale, like in most of 3D programs. So how did we create the quad? Well, by right-clicking it in the hierarchy window, 3D object, it's actually a 2D resemblance, but it is a 3D object and a quad, because we can see in its transform property that the scale on the z-axis that we are not using it, it's set to 1. So even if it's, it's thin, it's imaginable, like a, a piece of paper, it would need to have a scale of 1. If we would uh, put the scale down to 0, well, it would give an error, it's not properly seen. So we will always keep it on 1, on the z-axis. Or at least one, I think we can set it to three, one thousand, whatever, but at least one. Okay, another way to create things is to go to game object and, well, we do have a list of objects that we can create. I'm going to select another 3D object, another quad. We are going to work with quads here. So that would be another way. Let me move these quads around. Now, many times you you will create in Unity an empty object. And let's just create one. Right click and create empty. And as you can see, it actually created an object and I'm going to zoom in on it with a mouse wheel. And well, we can't see nothing. It is an empty object. It only has a component of transform. And it has a position, a rotation and a scale. And uh, this empty game objects, I'm going to name it empty. Okay, these empty name objects are very useful and we will see why further along. Uh, now, let's uh, try and modify this empty by adding components, so it should be something. So let's see how a quad is created. A quad has a mesh filter. So I'm going back to my empty, I'm adding a component, mesh filter. Well, if I would be selecting mesh, Unity al already comes with some primitive meshes. And if I would have imported an other meshes from other 3D programs that I have created, I would see them here. But for our purpose, I'm going to select quad. Okay. But we still can't see anything. Why? Because we need a mesh renderer. So, mesh again mesh render and yes now we can see it but because it doesn't have a material the render pipeline mm, it won't read it to put it so so everything that the render pipeline does not read will be displayed in, in this annoying pink okay so in order for it to be displayed i will select a material the default material all right so now we have transformed an empty into a quad. And continuing to add components, we can transform an empty into really complicated stuff, whatever, uh, whatever we would like. Imagination is the limit. Uh, back to our scene. Let's go in uh, to our project window and name our scene properly. So it is good practice to create a folder that is called resources. Why? Because Unity has a built-in uh, direction to this specific folder and later on we may use it to access things that we have in our resources folder like textures and uh, applying them automatically by with a script and uh, so on. So I would actually like to keep everything that I built in my resources folder. So I'm going to drag the scenes folder inside it I'm going to open it and uh, I'm going to rename the scene my first scene. Okay, and let's double click on it to open it. Yes, I want to save it. It's also good practice to press Ctrl S as many times. Whenever you're making a change, if you want to keep it, it's, uh, it's for the best to to, to press Ctrl S in order to save your scene. But uh, I'm sure that uh, this will come in with time. 
Okay, uh, let's go back to our resources folder. I would like to create another folder called scripts. All right, I would also like to delete everything I created until now. I have an empty scene, control S. Let's open scripts and uh, let's create our script. So right click, create C sharp script. My first script. And let's double click on it and uh, open it with our script editor, Visual Studio. So by default, Visual Studio comes like this with a white background and I personally prefer to keep it. In any case, if uh, anybody would like to change uh, the background, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, you would have to go to Tools, Options, and uh, you could select whichever color, color team you would like, dark for example, and it will change it automatically. Okay, but uh, as I said before, I like to prefer it light. Now with control and mouse wheel we can zoom in, zoom out. I'm going to zoom in a bit. So this is a default uh, Unity template. It's using some collections. We do not need to worry about them for now. Later on we will add some more collections that we are going to use. And by default, uh, whenever we we create a script, it's actually called a class. And in our case, it's my first script, the name. And uh, that the name of a class always have to resemble the name of a script. Otherwise, it would give us an error. For example, my first, mm, I'm going to write something, script, and save it. And if I go back to Unity, well, I do not have an error. Why? Because a script can't run by, uh, by itself, or at least not the scripts that are we are going to create for the moment. So what I'm going to do is to create an empty. I'm going to position it to zero, zero, zero. Even if I can't see it, it doesn't matter where it is, but I like to have it like that. And I'm going to add a component, my first script. Whoa. No, it can't see it. Let's drag it. Okay, so this is where I was telling you about. Now, if I would go back to rename it, git properly, control S. Now I'm going back to Unity. And now if I would add component, my first script would appear here. And uh, let's remove it remove component, I can also drag it. So, okay, I'll remove it again. Now, uh, having that said, inside a class, here is well, where we, where we write everything that we would like to implement. So by default, it has to function, a start function that it's executed only the first frame, uh, the game, the program, the application starts. And in update, it's well the update it's repeating each frame like if we would be using 60 frames per second this part here would be called 60 times per second so let's let's do something and see what they are about in uh, the start so on the first frame when i start the game i'd like to say hello world so a formula to do that is to write print brackets quotes and uh, whatever we'd like here hello world and all the lines need to end like this okay control s and let's go back to unity and if i would press play we should see hello world in our console tab well, we can see that nothing is happening. Why? Because our script can't run if it's not attached to an object in our scene. So now I'm going to drag it again and press play. Okay, so we can see in console, hello world. All right, let's see the difference in the update. So I'm going to select it, control X, 
and place it in the update. So let's press play. Hello world and we can see now it's running again and again and again and again each second repeating it. So I think this, uh, this should explain the difference between the start function and the update function. Later on we shall see that there are other functions void awake for example which is uh, a function that doesn't executes before the first frame before start uh, but we don't need to worry about that for now so i will stop this uh, video here and uh, we'll meet in the next one where we'll get to create some objects hello so continuing from the previous video i will rename the game object to game manager because it will be the main object that will carry my first script but i wouldn't want the script to be executing when i press play so we can uh, either uncheck it here or right click remove component but as we only have one line we can print a double slash here and the whole row it's commented so now it, it won't be executing and when I will press play, it won't be, it won't appear here, here, hello world, no more. Let's clear it and check. Okay, it is playing, so nothing is executing. All right, so let's create, I was thinking to create a type of console and some frames for our console. Yes, for the scripts that, <clears throat> let's have a graphic representation for the tests that we are going to make. All right, so I will right click right click and create a quad and I'm not sure why I'm not seeing it in my scene let's go move it to zero 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 oh, okay it was behind the camera <laughs> that's why we wasn't seeing it so yes it's good practice always to transform the position to zero 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 whenever creating creating things so this would be the left limit Now this, anybody can customize this however they, they'd like for the purpose of, so I'm, I'm moving it, maybe somewhere around here, just to fit the rectangle. All right. And now I will scale it on the Y axis, so the left limit. Now to create the right limit, I will press Ctrl D to double this object. And I will rename it, right limit. And uh, well, I will know where it should be on the x axis because it should be the opposite. So if this one is minus, the opposite should fit perfectly. Now let's create the upper limit. Oh, I'm always going to the UI, no quad. Per limit, let's zero it and uh, well I will eyeball it to put it so on the y-axis it should be at zero on the x-axis but on the y-axis is not so important maybe just a bit out of the actual camera frame now if a camera would be moving well, that would be a problem but the camera is not moving for for all purposes so I will scale it on the y on the x axis, and uh, maybe some yeah somewhere around there, and I will duplicate it. We can also press F two to rename it. Bottom limit. Um, limit. Okay. And the position should be the opposite on the y axis. Okay, so these are my limits and the display can be seen in the game view. Now let's create a 3D empty, uh, no, an empty. So I would uh, call it limits for organization purposes. I'm going to move it on zero and I will select and press shift and uh, click on and it selected all my limits. So. Let's do it again. I will select the left limit, press shift and 
press on the final object that I want to select. I selected them all and uh, dragging them into the limits component. Now what we just did is parenting these limits to the <laughs> to the game object called limits and this would be children of a parented object. So for example now what a parent does if I'm rotating it or moving it all the sub all the children will move with it or scale so I can move it I can scale it on the Y as well okay or rotating it now if for example let me unparent them quickly I would have this one here the parent somewhere let's make the scene view bigger somewhere around this area for example and I will parent them again if I would be rotating it it the pivot point would be here so this is very useful in many many cases that we may want to use this notion but for now uh, what I created only has a an organizatory purpose so I'm going to zero it okay and let's give some colors to to our scene to our frames I'm going to create a new folder called materials now inside materials I'm going to right click and uh, select create material and I will name it color one no color now uh, you do not need to worry about all these options we will work with this shader standard and maybe further on we'll change the opacity the rendering mode like change it to transparent depending on on our needs but please feel free to to go and play and test with uh, with all these settings another setting that we will be using is the albedo map and actually the albedo color for now so I will select a desaturated green for this one and I'm going to duplicate it one two three four five five colors I've made and now only changing the color on the wheel it will help me keep the same saturation parameter but uh, this is more like it's customizable however anybody would like to create it okay and this one so I'll make my left and right now to add the color I will select for example the left limit and I want it to be bluish okay so now we can see both in the game view and in the scene view that it turned blue ish now the right limit and I will drag it and uh, let's select both the upper and the bottom limit and we will make them greenish okay so we do have our limits in bad taste but we do have limits so this would be the way yes to create uh, and add a basic way of creating objects and adding color to them let's try and uh, please try and create uh, different objects with uh, parents and uh, for example let's create uh, some sort of a windmill I will try and uh, move faster just uh, to show the process so yes my quad okay I will zero it on the position so let me just okay I'll press F to zoom on it Ooh, too much and let's scale it okay let's duplicate it Control D I will rotate it on the Z axis axis to 90 now I'll select them both I'll duplicate them again and actually I'm gonna try to rotate them by here something like this okay now uh, mm -hmm. 3d objects another quad I'll zero it so this would be like the parent 
I will select them all and put them inside the pair. Now let's give it a color to the parent, green, and all of the other quads should be, I don't know, this one. So now, for example, if I'm rotating my quad, should be rotating all of them. Now I'd like to maybe duplicate this. Let's position this, actually, rotation zero. I want to zero it on all of them, and this one as well, zero, zero. And uh, let's actually scale it a bit on both X and Y. So let's say with the uh, Alt I am panning. So let's uh, move, uh, let's duplicate them again actually. I want four of them. So I would uh, move one to two, the other one to minus two, this one to on the Y, and this one, the last one, to minus two. So now let's create yet another quad. Now this one maybe to zero it. Okay. Ah, something like that. Make it purple. We can also drag the material in the hierarchy. Same goes for scripts and for whichever component we would like to add. So let's parent this quad to quad 4. Now, if I'm rotating the main quad, all the other quads should be rotating and we can maybe create connections like if this main quad is rotating 5 degrees, all the smaller quads should be rotating uh, the double the degrees. And uh, well, different, uh, different behaviors for whichever we, we would like. Uh, however, before going into that, let's uh, let's go and prepare our our console. But we are going to learn some new notions first. So I will see you in the next video. Hello. Continuing from the previous video, an important thing that slipped my mind, and I wanted to talk about, uh, are the prefabs. So let's go ahead in our resources folder and create yet another folder called prefabs. Uh, well, what is a prefab? Prefab is an object or combined objects in a certain way with materials, lights, uh, anything you can imagine. And uh, well, it is useful because we can save it and it's pretty easy to do. Let's, let me rename this quickly. So I'm not going to create a windmill actually, it's going to be a rotating bullet if it's going to be something. So by only clicking it and dragging it in our project folder, it created a prefab. Now we can see, let me just open the prefab and I'm going to alter it. It opened everything that this game object contains. So let's, for example, take this quad here let me just copy its transform, copy component, and I'm going to set it here. Okay. And I will press save. So I will go back in the hierarchy and we can see it actually altered this prefab as well. And all of the others, for example, I'm going to duplicate it. Control D, Control D, Control D. Let me move them around. And uh, I'm going to back to open the prefab. I think double clicking it would do. Yes, I'm going to select no, no, this one here. And uh, I'm going to paste the component values. And uh, I'm going to press auto save. I'm going to go back. And here we are back at the normal. Now, another good thing is that we can actually delete them but we still have it in our prefab and whenever we are going to need it we can just drag it. it uh, this is a good thing because it uh, can also be created by script and uh, that process is called instantiating something to instantiate and uh, we will uh, further on we'll study it. So for now I just saved my prefab 
and uh, actually I'm going to save the limits as well because maybe I want to delete them yes I will delete them and uh, now I think if I want them again just dragging it okay now a thing I wanted to change and uh, show about the materials before we go to the next stage so I will add this let's say for example I'd like uh, the center part of a rotating bullet I would like it to be rounded now I could modify it here and save another prefab so let's say I want to modify it here um, prefab unpack unpack completely and now it's not a prefab anymore but we still have the other the saving the saved one and we can see its name with blue so back to what I wanted to do I wanted to add yet another material and uh, it's a good thing that unity for some resources it needs has some built-in texture for buttons for input fields and we can make uh, use of those for example to to make this thing uh, look round so I'll go in materials I will create uh, another material and call it um, bullet center okay and uh, I will attach it to the bullet center and uh, now I go back to the material so what I was telling you about albedo well albedo it's a map that gives the color and uh, and uh, the alpha information alpha information is how transparent an object is like for example if we can modify the alpha here if it would be zero I know we would it we would see it transparent like if it would be cut out we should not see it at all so with that in mind I will go right on here and uh, find uh, I will type circle in all and as I told you we do have a variety of circles here so I'm just going to click on the first one for example and drag it into my albedo all right now let's set the alpha to maximum and as we can see as it's a cutout material well it cuts where where there is no nothing painted that's why we can we can have a circle that's how we could have a circle we can also create our own maps in whichever program we would like Photoshop is really known for that and Illustrator is very useful user interface wise uh, but okay for the purpose of this demonstration this is what I wanted uh, to show you and maybe we'll I actually most probably will use this with quads in order to give them a, a round form so I'm going to just select a, a color which I like this one here and uh, I'm not sure if you played with it but we can see at another detail here emission so emission it is what, what it says it emits lights so let's select something green phosphorescent green okay and here we can control the levels that is going to go yellowish because we do not have any shadows we do not have a light created uh, but in 2D there are other procedures however uh, this the circle detail it is important and now I will save I will uh, erase here I'll go back to my prefabs I will delete the before prefab and I will add this new one and now let's delete it and yep here I got it okay I will delete this as well and uh, this created uh, do not uh, uh, don't worry about that I'll show it to you in a second uh, let's go to our next video where we will create a basic user interface for our console all right see ya hello again so back from where we left off 
we were about to create our user interface, well actually uh, a frame for our console and uh, all the other components. So we are going to use images. For that purpose let's create another folder called textures. Okay, and regarding the images we can either search for them or create them ourselves. I went and searched in Google for frame textures PNG. Why PNG? Because I would like it to have an opacity map. It's not mandatory to have an opacity map, but I think it's good practice to play with opacity. An alpha channel which actually displays where and how transparent uh, an image is. Uh, however, a targa could be used or any other format that uh, that supports transparency. So I went and browsed ahead, but I did I did not find anything that uh, that suited me. So I went and quickly created uh, two images, uh, a frame and a simple rectangle. So I'm going to drag them in inside my project, inside the textures folder. And uh, here we need to make sure that they are that the texture type, so I'm clicking on the image, it's set to sprite 2D and UI. It could be set on something else, for example. No, then we would have to set it to sprite and click apply. Uh, okay, so let's create our border. I'm going to right click, uh, user interface and image. And I'm going to create, to rename this to border. Now, we can see that with the image, an event system was created. Well, this is handling inputs and buttons and it's always created when a canvas is created. However, an image, the border image that we just created, can't exist by itself in Unity. It needs and is correlated with a canvas. And, well, the canvas is a very important uh, detail here. So I will, uh, let's see, by default, comes in a screen space overlay. What does that mean? If this is our camera window, I'm going to also create a quad. No, 3D. So this is our small camera window. I'm going to set the quad's position on Z axis to zero. So this is our small camera window, the overlay canvas, which, and by default, when a canvas is created, it's also set always set on overlay. Well, it's huge, but it tends to keep the same aspect, actually it is perfectly the same aspect as our camera. So, overlay means precisely, it's on top of everything else that's uh, shown. And this type of canvas, it's very good to create a user interface uh, for 3D projects. For 2D projects, I find it better because let's uh, let's just place the of a border. So here is my border, and I'm going to. It's an image. The image component has a source image, and we'll just drag the frame inside here. So here is our frame. Now I'm gonna make use of a rect tool to actually snap it to the margins. Okay, that was easy. So, uh, as I was saying, it would be incommodating and I think it would bother me if I would be working in this scene and always have to see that. Uh, however, if the camera is moving, it doesn't matter. In 3D, it's a, it's a different thing. It could work. So, there is another type of canvas. Screen space camera. And... I would have to select the ca main camera and as we can see the whole big thing out there just snapped to my camera. And this is a very practical way to create the user interface for 2D projects. Now there is a third type of canvas, the world space. Now this uh, type of canvas it's actually used for example to display the HP bar of an enemy and that's why I made the rectangle that is that is that is going to be on the HP bar uh, but back to exploring the canvas so yes for 2d games we are just going to let it on screen space uh, camera 
So I'm going to move the camera, for example, and I can see that the border is moving with it. The quad is still. Now let's change it yet once again to screen space overlay and I will move the main camera and we are watching the game view and we can see that we have the same effect. However, there are some uh, different uh, methods and functions that uh, apply to the different canvases, but for now they, they are pretty similar to us. However, for example, I think a screen space camera canvas in, inside this type of canvas it would be easier to implement some um, uh, touch input. Uh, but for now we don't need to worry about that, just that it's, uh, it's our canvas and it moves with the camera. So we do have a border here and I'm going to rename this camera canvas and uh, let's create uh, another image for our rectangle image. Now we see that by default it's creating it inside the inside the canvas that already has been created. So I'm going to delete it. And if I want to use a world canvas, I would have to create a new canvas first. So canvas, I would write it enemy one canvas, for example. And this canvas shall be set in world space. And I'm going to create an image as well inside that canvas image this would be the HP bar. Now I'm going to press F to see where the image is. Well, as the canvas was created in overlay, it is still huge. Now I do know that the proportions of my rectangle were 50 and 200, no, 200 width and 50 high. So now I'm going to center it inside my camera view, scene view, if you like, and I'm going to scale it. I'm going to press F and I'm going to scale it some more. Okay, so I'm going to center on it. So this would be our HP bar. Uh, now, something important I did not mention in all the canvases actually all in screen space or overlay it's very important not to forget the canvas scaler this is a very important component and it will scale with a screen size if we do not select this then uh, it will be it will be trouble the reference resolution uh, is going to be full HD Okay, and now we will have to modify all that. Otherwise, the, the canvas would be always scaling. So I'm going to the border thing, scaling and rescaling, and fit it nicely there. Okay, back to our enemy canvas in world space. Let's select the main camera and in the HP bar I'm going to drag my rectangle image, which is a white image. Why it's white? Because I can uh, choose the color of my liking. I'm going to select it red. Now inside the image component we see that the image type can be of various types. So I'm for this purpose I'm going to select field. And what that does, well, we do have a fill amount and uh, a fill method. So if it would be a circle, for example, we could uh, modify through a script this fill amount in order to give us uh, the graphic representation of the amount of health that we have. But we are going to select it to be horizontal and from the left. So now uh, I can see precisely what uh, how by altering this amount this is how the enemy's life graphic representation would be modifying so now i'm just going to duplicate this bar 
and uh, I'm going to take out the sprite that I just added and I'm going to rename this HP bar background so it should be behind and I'm going to change the color just so we can see all right actually a more blackish red dark red yes so now if I would modify it has a better graphic impression okay but we do I just wanted uh, to show this because uh, the canvas part is a very important part and I think it's important to get it right from the beginning uh, we won't be using this I'm just going to delete it it was just for the practice so what else uh, would we want in our console we do have a border now we could make an image for our background but in uh, our main camera we do have uh, an option to select a background so I'm going to select a dark blue something like this and uh, well we are going to need a text so I clicked the camera canvas UI and the normal text should do now we only have one type of font let's make it well we can't see it I'm going to zoom on it and uh, I'm going to modify this so like the text for the area yes maybe this one here and I would like it to be centered I'm going to select it font size something like this and uh, let's assign let's give it a color mm, not totally white something like this so our welcome text should be I don't know welcome welcome to a console 2022 Z Z R three four, just to give it a, a really weird name. All right, so we have created this. So this text, we will be modifying its text component of a text game object in order to give our answers. So instead of hello world written in the console, we will have it written here. Um, well I think we we are set to go to to continue with scripting however if you'd like to modify this and uh, add maybe a variety of uh, images like a background so I will background one or maybe I'm going to create two backgrounds as many as you'd like I'm going to set it behind the border R okay and um, see what color I would like it to have this color and I'm just going to alter it slightly like this and let's see so we could maybe create more and more borders and now I'm going to duplicate this background too. Make it slightly smaller and give it another color. Okay, something like this. So whatever you'd like, there's no limits. Well, uh, I will stop here and we'll continue with the scripting. See you in a bit. Hello, back from where we left off. All right, before we start with uh, our first script, uh, let's repass the most important aspects. So inside camera canvas, we need to make sure that the screen space is set to camera and that the main camera it is attached to the render camera. And the plane distance here it comes by default to 100 this 
plain distance I'll switch to 3D mode if I'm going to alter it is the distance at which our user interface is rendered and uh, I never had any problems with uh, keeping it at 100 but it is uh, a precaution and it is better to to leave it at a plain distance like uh, as small as possible so one it is a good distance why because this way you can make sure that nothing will intersect or come between uh, the camera and your user interface because normally the user interface should not be for example altered by or affected by shadows so i will keep it at one and the most important thing is we never need to forget to select it here scale with screen size because otherwise it's a headache so the game aspect needs to match the reference resolution or better said the reference resolution needs needs to match the game aspect so here it would be similarly okay oh full hd i already had it so, so we can see that they match but uh, as i said before 16 with 9 aspect is the same as the full HD but it does have a, a better quality if I'm selecting it like this in the game view okay so now back to our script we are going to start with uh, the variables so I'm going to check the game manager uh, the script is opened and uh, I prepared a short list of variables that we are going to use integers for counting and indexing IDing and so on floats which are decimals or integers that <laughs> may have decimals as well well for anything related with forces speed acceleration and also related with time and booleans to identify if something is true or false and string to store information and use them as as helpers mainly and yes anything text related like when creating a chat and yes text textual information uh, vector 2, well, we are going to use it for in example in uh, controlling the input of our characters. And uh, vector 3, we can also use it as a vector 2 plus the z position set to 0. But uh, mainly in order to make use of uh, some specific formulas, like to get the distance or the direction. And uh, a game object. Well, is anything uh, like a prefab, like uh, we created earlier with quads, or anything that carries a component. Even uh, an empty could be a game. It is a game object, but it is an empty game object. However, it does have a transform component, if you remember. So the way we declare a variable in Unity, it's simple. Let's uh, start creating in an integer. My int equals one. So we can see I saved it, Control S, and I changed back to the Unity Editor. And in the Inspector, inside Game Manager, we can see that nothing happened. Now, actually, my int like this, it should have been spelled. Because this would be a private variable. If I would add private, it's the same thing. Private int, my int. And we shall see that nothing happens. Now, I will make it public and I will change the first character to a capital one, my int, like this. And we can see that indeed now it's, it is shown in Inspector and we can alter it uh, publicly, not uh, privately. Otherwise, if it would have been private, it can only be changed from inside the script. Uh, not let's say we do have a script for a car and that car has a speed but the speed is altered by some other script that controls the safe limit speed let's put it so if that uh, variable of speed would not be public the other script could not access it 
However, in our case, we are going to make most or I'm not sure if all, but almost all of our variables public. And uh, why? Because uh, this is a good way to monitor and see what's happening, at least while, while we we get the sufficient experience, but I find it better to keep them publicly in order to investigate. So we don't really need to declare it public int my int and we'll set it to zero. It, it does not need to have a value, but we can add a value if we so do want. Uh, okay, so I prepared some variables public in my int, public float my float, and they are all shown inside the inspector. Now, a boolean, it is true or false. Whenever it is true, this square here, it is checked. And the string, we can write anything. And this would be a vector two, for example, a position. And this would be the same position, but in vector three and keeping the z to zero. All right, so let's try and do something. So here it is how I declared the variables. So in update, let's print the state of our Boolean, my, and I can see it here. I can click on it or just press tab and the autocomplete is gonna do the rest of the work. So now when I will be executing the application in console, we can see that it is true. Now if I will uncheck it, we can see that it is false. True, false, and so on. Now, for example, let's uh, get the value of a string equal to the boolean. So my string equals my bool. And there is a formula or a method to uh, to get the value or anything actually to a string. Convert numbers, decimals, a boolean into a string. And uh, that, that formula is pretty easy, just to string and parenthesis, semicolon. So now we should see when we are executing it that my string should have the same value as my bool. False, true, false, true. And this is also resembled in the console because we are printing it. I will cancel everything. So yes, I think this is a very basic introduction to variables and uh, well next let's uh, let's put them in action we do need a few more notions so before we make objects moving and uh, flying around so i will see you in uh, our next video where we can uh, try and make use of these variables hello so continuing from where we left off let's uh, let's also add a game object because we specified it here we are not going to make use of it but uh, let's see how we uh, how it looks in in the interface my game object okay so now if i go back to the inspector i can uh, either for example from our prefabs uh, directory, we can simply drag. Or I'm going to select none. We can actually select a game object from our scene where we can see everything that we have created until now or from the assets. So for now, I'm going to keep it like this. Okay, I'm uh, going to comment all this. This is going to be useful later on. So for now, what I'm trying to do is for us to gather as many notions as possible and then use them to create a more sophisticated operation. 
to put it so. So one formula that is important uh, it's uh, how do we get the notion of time and it is good that Unity does have a way to get that and it is very aware of time so I'm going to uh, create a float variable public my time and I'm going to set it to zero by default it comes to zero but it's just a double check and we update my time equals with my time plus and here is the formula time dot delta time and without the brackets without parentheses control s and that's all we need to get a sense of the time so i'm going to press play and precisely these are the seconds that have passed since we started the application i'm going to stop it and uh, this is an important uh, formula because we can make use of it whenever we we would like whenever we need it and we are going to need it for for a lot of, of stuff um, another important uh, actually important another interesting formula is how to get a random number without having any favorites no because 55 is uh, my birthday and uh, so no it's the day of my birthday 55 no uh, so a way to do that is with random range random dot range but let's print it actually print brackets random range and again brackets so we have to give a minimum and mean inclusive and max inclusive so before i think they updated this with this last unity before the maximum wasn't inclusive so let's say for example if i would uh, give it random range between one and two it should it should choose one always but let's let's test it in the console and it gave us one i'm going to run it again also one clear it run it again also one one more test okay so it will always include the minimum but exclude the maximum so if i would like to get a number between one and two i would have to put here the maximum of three and three will never be selected whoops Control s and let's test again now we did get a two and actually let's execute it 60 times a second so we can make sure about it clear it okay yep so we only get a result between one and two and if i'm gonna stop it after i know 10 seconds well they're more or less similar now let's get between zero to ten to nine yeah let's keep it like this no to ten because we want to include nine as well yes now as you can see the results are always in int by default the random range gives them in int now if we'd like them to be in float we would only have to add an f here 10 f and as you can see we are uh, getting random random range float results i'm going to stop it now another formula i would like to we should go and see about before we start doing other things let's create another float public float uh, my test float and in update 
this is a mathematical formula so I would say my public know what my test float it is public yes equals to math f I don't even break it actually I'm going to delete them move towards and I'm actually going to need a, another variable a speed variable public float my speed and let's create public int my int min my int max so what this does method that move towards brackets so it will move from uh, its current state which would be zero by default towards a, a number of our choosing or whichever required in the operation that we are doing and it will move at a certain speed in time so the current float it should be my test float it's the same one max maximum my max int my int max and uh, speed my speed so we could do get my float to get from 0 to 10 at a certain speed and then to get to from 10 which would be its value to 0 to my int mean so let's let's see how it's working so my int max I want it to get to 10 my speed at 1 I will clear this and uh, we are going to monitor my test float so it should increase at the speed of 1 to 10 so this would be similar with the time now if I would double the speed it would go from 0 towards 10 at double the speed of time yep and it stopped so next we are going to set it to go from uh, once it reached the maximum value to go towards its minimum value hello so continuing from where we left off okay well our plan was to make a float go from a minimum to a maximum and then come back to the minimum and this would be the formula I'm actually going to erase everything and create a you can you can comment it if you need it for further reference but I'm going to use more natural more humane naming for for our variables so I'm going to create a two public ints int min int max okay simple another public float my float and we will need a speed and we will also need a boolean limit reached okay now we are going to bring the if statement so I think this is very important we are going to make a lot of use of it and only with the if statement we could represent like most of the things we will ever need however we will also need a uh, well, for loop but we are going to study it after so the if statement if limit reached is true and this is an operator and brackets and here we get to set our function what uh, we would like for it to do and I'm going to plan it I will say yes the limit has been reached because it will start at zero so I will give the value of zero to my int mean and the value of max to my int max we could add yet another bool 
but uh, I'm going to work only only with this equals true so if limit reached my test floats I'm going to change actually I'm going to write it again my float equals math f at move towards my current value which would be zero at the first frame max no max int int max so oh. speed by time dot delta time okay so we know that it will go up if limit reached now once it will reach the limit if my float is uh, smaller no it's um, bigger or equal to 9.9 f I will change my bool to false. So we could actually add more nines in here because it will get to 10. So we will make this one false and then it should go down. So if actually else if so it will, it will enter only once of the loops limit reached different from true or it's the same as writing it is false so this would be the same those are uh, comparison operators so we said it should be false then my float should go from math f move towards my current value to int mean speed by time and once it reaches the limit I should have written maybe lower limit reached yeah we will change it after limit reached we'll set it to false but when well we need another if my float it is smaller or equal to 0 dot 0 0 1 f break it okay so this should actually work now let me rename this now a way to rename this I will press ctrl F and uh, limit reached I will replace it with lower replace all okay so that's a way to replace all the names or the variable in all the places so let's see how this works I'll set the speed to 1 the minimum to 0 and the maximum to 7 so it should go to 7 and go back to 0 after and it did not yes because we actually select it to 10 so let's do something else it's bigger than max limit int max minus and this should be int mean plus
and let's test it again. I will increase the speed to three, seven, almost seven, and it's stuck at zero. Why? No, here it should be true. Well, investigation is our weapon, so now it will work. And it's balancing between uh, 0 and 7. Now, how could we use this? Let's, for example, create a, create a quad. 3D object, quad. Uh, my quad. And I'm going to assign to it... Uh, I'm going to center it in the side of the scene to zero. Zero. But we can't see it because of a we can't see it because of a background. So I'm going to turn off the canvas. So let's try and uh, we will get uh, into detail in the transform component, but for now let's just try and change its position on X to be the same as its position as a, our float. So I will create a game object. Now, we do know that a position can be resembled by a vector 2 or by a vector 3. In this case, it can be by a vector 2 because the position on the Z, it will always be zero. So let's use a, it's either way, let's use a vector two. Public vector two, my quads position. So my quad position in the update should always be quads position equals new vector 2. This is the formula. So the x we said we would want it to be my float and its, uh, its own position so the game object, my quad, dot transform, dot position, dot y. So now I can uh, simply equalize equals with my quad's position. So, for example, why I kept the same uh, position and why I could have uh, wrote zero? Well, you'll see in a moment. Ah, yes, we forgot to assign my quad. So my quad, it is a game object. Game manager. Just drag it there. So we assign a game object and now it should work and it should start from zero. Let's increase the speed. I'm going to alter on the limits. Whoa. So the limit it should be 3 minus 12. All right, let's see how it goes now. Let's increase the speed. All right, so now we have an uh, oscillating quad. Okay, let's uh, repeat how we created this. So true, true ifs. I created a Boolean and uh, I set it to true because I know that I will start at the lower limit. So if we already reached the lower limit, my float, which actually determines 
my quads X position should go from its lower limit to the maximum limit within a t uh, within time. So we create a limit for our for our float. We start at the lower end and we are going towards the maximum end. Now we could also use the operator equal equal because we are interested in it uh, getting to its maximum value. But uh, mathf move towards usually gives a very very small error like I don't know the sixth decimal or something but it will never get to be equal equal it's like similar so that's why it's better to use bigger than or equal and here on the lower end smaller than or equal when it means that zero plus a small small number and then this part here we are going to study the positions in detail however I created a vector 2 and uh, I assigned uh, it, my quads position to it and then I equalize my quads transform that position to that vector 2 and this repeats always in update now because we we may have many functions in an update let's say we do have 10 quads each with a different way of moving now we could create a method and the method is created like this inside the class we can do it uh, wherever we'd like before the start or between the start and update however I like to keep them at the end depending so I'm going to create a function public void by uh, this would be the, the default and we make it public because maybe we would do uh, want to access it from outside like uh, use a button for it it's not the case but by default we will, we will make them public uh, it's good to create private voids when uh, maybe you're working on bigger projects and uh, many people are working on it and you wouldn't want anybody to tamper with uh, with your script but it, this is not the case so we are going to keep everything public just so we can monitor it better so public void my first function which is the one oscillating uh, so I have created it and now I can cut everything I wrote here but not the update break it and copy paste it so now I do have a clean update and for example if I'm running it now nothing runs in the update and nothing changes here but how do we call a function well my first function it's intuitive parenthesis semicolon and now it will run in the update all this so we can have many many functions in an update uh, in an infinity of functions if we would have a an infinite processing power so now if I'm running it yep I will increase the speed okay and by setting uh, equalizing the vector 2 to the quads uh, y position means that this would work wherever I place I place the quad on the y position but yes it will start from the me oh from zero no so let's actually implement something else in start I would like my quad position to be my quad position equals to new vector 2 So this is the same as equalizing it with a vector 2 but I'm just creating directly the vector 2 uh, int min and my quad that y so it won't be changed now if this doesn't work 
we are going to set it in the awake. Yes, it, it did work. Let me do yet another test, speed 10. Yes, it moved and then it started moving. Okay, well, so this would be the basic of a if statement. We are going to learn more operators along the way. Uh, next is going to be the for loop. And then we can uh, applicate them to create a, a whole operation. All right, then, uh, see you in our next video. Goodbye. So continuing from where we left off, in uh, this part, uh, I would like to make use of a camera canvas and of a console, at least to a basic level. So I raised the quad that we had here. I'm going to activate the canvas and we are going to make use of a for loop as well. So I'm going back to my first project. I commented the last uh, lines. So to comment a whole line, you can use Ctrl K, Ctrl C and to uncomment them, Ctrl K, Ctrl U. Okay, Ctrl C. I want them commented and inside here as well, yes. It is also commented. So I'm thinking to build a for loop, actually two for loops. Uh, I will create an empty with a, an, an empty parent and uh, it will have uh, some children and these children will have a variety of information like a name, an ID and some other variables. So for this I'm going to create an empty here and I'm going to call it parent object. Now inside of a parented object I'm going to create another empty. I don't care about the position they have right now for the purpose of uh, this part of a project is not important. So child object. Okay, so now I will create another script called object info. This object info, I actually let's create it again. I made a previous test. I'm going to delete it. We will create a C sharp script object info. And uh, We don't need nor the start function nor the update. This will only carry the object information. So it should have a string, public string, string called my name, public int, my ID, and uh, let's set an attack as well public uh, float attack. So this would be helpful in the case that we, we would create an inventory, for example. So now I will select the child object, I will attach the script and I will duplicate the child object as many times as we would like to. And um, well, if we would be creating an inventory, it would actually have a name, sword magic sword one id two for example and an attack of some value however i i'd like to name him automatically and uh, also then use another script to find the name where or the id and get the name out of the id i'm not sure yet so let's go, let's go to it i'm going into my first script i created a public void my for loop and I will need a reference to the parented game object. So I will create a public my parent object and I will attach it in the inspector game manager and I will drag my parent object in here. Okay, so the first loop that we are going to create is going to name our ch our children objects. So for I only typed for and tab tab and this is the formula 
in order to make a 4. And uh, the length should be equal to my parent object dot transform dot get child no dot child count and let's test if we get the proper child count so print my parent object actually I'm curious if it will work without the transform no we need to type in transform so yes we can see that we have uh, 15 children and now I'm going to duplicate and you can see it's modifying in real time however when I will stop it all the modifications we did uh, while playing are erased I will clear this let's go back to our script so I will delete this from here and let's see so for all the children over there let's access them my parent so this is a formula that transform to get the component and now I'm going to get the child which child I so it will go from 0 to 15 through all the child there nope that transform and uh, I would need to get another component get component and I know that all the children have this component object info and it's obtained like this so let's start with uh, the ID dot ID my ID equals I don't know let's make them um, to go from 3 to 3 I multiplied with 3 now let's uh, transform their name as well so I will copy this info dot my name equals to oh I will uh, take advantage hence we are here if I would uh, set this to private my name I think we'll get an error yes we do get an error because it's not accessible so that is why it should be public okay my name should be string um, child plus my ID no plus actually I would have to write this again so I'm going to continue on the second D for the triple and this should be written something like this if I'm not wrong to string uh, let's check if it's working so the name should be the triple of the ID okay and it's nothing happening Oh yes, why not? Because we are not executing the loop. So I'm going to run it in the update. Actually, maybe just in the start. No, let's run it on in the update. Loops are uh, for the purpose of this test. We are going to run it on the update, but generally should be avoided to run many loops inside an update, or a loop inside the loop inside the loop, and so on, because it uh, it would make the update a lot longer and it would stress the, the computer so let's see how it goes yeah my id6 and child name is the triple of its id and the id goes 
Yeah, it's correct. Let's also add a space here, child space. So uh, these are formulas. They should be uh, learned as they are. So I am accessing a game object, which I specified here. Then I'm getting its child in this case, or all of them. And then I'm getting a component from that child, which we created. But for example, with a child with, uh, let's say they would be squares, quads, and they would have a color. We could actually get that component, the mesh renderer, and uh, change the color or whatever we would like to. But uh, not, uh, that's not the case. So the attack, let's change the attack as well. I will co copy this. Attack equals to, mm, I don't know, the, my ID. No. To a hundred. Let's uh, let's not change it. All of them have the same attack. It's just for the purpose of uh, of demonstration. So now, as we can see, they are not named. Okay. I will go to prefabs, and I will take the parent object and uh, add it here. Now. As this, all of them changed at playtime. When uh, I, I press stop, they will be returned to zero. Now, if I delete this and add the parent object, in the prefab that we created, well, they stayed the same. So now I actually don't need this parent object. Or I, I do need the parent object, but I don't need to do to execute that functions anymore. So, okay. Now we will go and create a second loop. So for, I will copy this because we'll go again to all the children and uh, I need to add a bracket so I would say if and now let's uh, find a string public string searching uh, text oops no Searching text G. So if searching equals equals here, we can use the equal equal because it must be something very precise. No, actually ID, my ID, do the following, my ID to string. Uh, okay, so this is, these are kind of complicated lines, but not so. We are going again through all the children and now I need to compare a name ID that I will be searching here. So how do I compare it? Well, I am, uh, no, actually it, it would have been easier to compare an int if we are comparing it to my ID. So I will public int searching ID. searching ID. So if the searching ID is the same as the child ID, I will uh, want my text 
so let's make a new a new string public string my string no and we will also need a public text now in order to use a text we need to use the user interface component so you need to add here unity engine dot ui and we did that with the purpose of creating a text as well public text my text so in this case i'm going to get the string to be whatever i would like to and then uh, the text i could also do it directly with the text but no i let's let's do it into steps so if the id is found my string equals uh, object found or child found id plus id no plus found so let me separate this on two lines control k control d should organize it better plus found uh, and the name is i will go on another line yet Plus my name okay so let's see how this works I'm going to just read the string of a parent object yes so I'm going to search for an ID 30 Oh, but uh, I'm not uh, I'm not executing anything in the update, so I'll need to my loop, my for loop two, and now it should be executing. I will go to the game manager. Child ID zero found, and the name is child zero precisely so let's type an id we said 13 found and the name is child 90. okay so now comes the easy part we will repass all this all of this and uh this should, maybe it's not uh, the best beginning information for a for loop but uh, we will use them extensively and uh, i'm sure it will get explained better I wa just wanted you to see how you can get a component. So now yet we are going to use another component, the text component. So let me go here. In my text, which text do I want to alter? This one here, which it has actually the name text. I would like to rewrite it, let's see, just so there isn't any confusion, console text. So we can name it whatever. However, that this object with the name console text does have a text component, which we will be accessing it from here. So in my text, whoops, my text equals to my string. Oh no, there is an error. My, it's correct. My text dot text. 
So we access the console text and the text component inside, which is this one. So let's see how it's working. Press play. Okay, let's uh, go into game manager and search for ID 18. Yep. Um, all right, next we are going to do one more for loop, but uh, with graphic representation. So I'm going to pause uh, to break this video here and we are going to continue in the next one. Hello, so starting from where we stopped in, in the previous video, uh, I erased the parent object and uh, let's let's try and get a better graphic illustration of a for loop. So I will stop the camera canvas and I'm thinking to instantiate uh, some quads and uh, make them blink. So in the script we will need, I'm actually going to comment everything. Uh, please feel free to organize yourself however you, you feel better. In this case, of, as these are very basic things, I prefer to have them uh, all together, maybe in case of, for future reference, if needed. I will delete this from the update. And let's comment everything else. Control K, Control C. Control K, Control C. Not the last bracket, because that is our class. So, I will delete this info here about the start, because I already know that it is executing only in the first frame. And I will also delete this info about the update. So we will need a, a game object that we are going to instantiate, actually, with, using the for loop. So public game object. I'm going to create a quad, my quad. Now, my quad will actually be a compound object. If we are going to make it blink, it should have a background and a blinking part. So I'm going to create an empty. I'm going to move it at 0, 0, 0. I'm going to... No create a quad and I'm going to name it quad BG from background and this would be my quad parent quad BG and uh, I'll create another 3D object another quad and this should be a blinking quad or blink just like this. So this is the background. Let's go and uh, create some materials for it. I'm going to actually I'm going to duplicate this one. One, two. So I'm going to use color five and color six. I want them to be cut out, and I'm going to search for the circle again. Okay, in case you do not see the circle, uh, maybe by mistake you have toggled this, or this was toggled. So just by pressing the this eye icon, we can we can find it. So in the albedo, I have a two materials selected. In the albedo, I will add this, and I will make them red. Now, I will close this, and I will go. So number six will be the background. I'll make it darker. So I will uh, assign color 6 to the quad BG and blink to this. Now we can't really see them inside the scene. Why? Well, because they are both at 0 on the Z axis. Now the camera is set to minus 10 and I reset it the position on X to 0 as well. So, we need the background to be further away from the camera. So we could just type in here 0 0.001. And let's make the background slightly bigger. Okay. And 
So now we will create a variety of quads and via script we will make the blinking part activate and deactivate. So let's make this a prefab. My quad, I have it. Uh, it doesn't refresh inside the project, I'm not sure why, but uh, it, it looks okay, nothing happens. I, we can try Ctrl R or refresh as well, but I doubt that until I will restart the, uh, the Unity editor will work. So now I can delete this quad. Let's go into Game Manager and add my quad. All right. So now uh, let's try and instantiate them. But let's see from which limits. So if I'm not wrong, minus seven, minus eight, two, eight. Okay, let's delete it. So let's go to create a function. I will minimize all this. And I have created only one variable until now, and which is a game object. Let's create some int with origin and a limit. And let's create a function to instantiate the quad. So instantiating it means creating repeatedly the same prefab. Um, so let's name this public void. Instantiate my quad now. Control K, Control D. So they organize together. And I'm going to say for tab tab int i equals to origin because I want to start at minus eight and uh, it should end at limit which would be plus eight. So the easiest way to instantiate a quad would be instantiate my quad. So let's see what happens in Unity. Nothing happens. Why? Because we are not calling it in update. So let's call it instantiate my quad now. And let's see what happens in Unity. Nothing happens. Why? Because we did not configure this. So the origin should be minus eight and plus eight. Oops. Eight. There you go. Let's press play. Okay. So we are using it in update and we are instantiating quads and quads. Let's transform the position. So let's have a control of the quads. Another way to instantiate objects is to create a new ob ob a new game object oops okay space space back back so the formula would be this one game object we can enter whichever name we would like here uh, the name that I want equals to new game object no 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 game object the name that I want equals to instantiate my quad so instead of only this it comes to this so now we can alter the position of what we created the name that I want let's give it actually another name uh, new quad new quad instance so let's access the new this new quad instance dot transform dot position equals to new vector 2 what uh, do we want it to be i on the x and 0 on the y 
let's separate it a bit so now uh, I'm ju just a reminder I'm still executing it in update it should only execute in start because it keeps creating quads and quads but at least for now it is distanced but it keeps creating quads so let's uh, oops let's uh, call it in start and not in update Control s so yes i created only 16 quads i think yes 16. now let's give them a bit of separation so i'm thinking to do this like uh, if uh, now they are instantiating from uh, one to one from the distance of one on the x-axis so but let's make them to instantiate from two units this at two units distance so we could say that if the reminder of i to two is zero then instantiate it else not so a way to do that it's an operator if i percent two equals equals is precisely zero then do all this and if not we could actually instantiate another type of quad but for the example for the purpose of our example we are going only to use one type of quad so let's see how this goes okay now we do have a separation and it stops here now i would actually want to have eight included as well let's see which uh, distance was that I think it was six if I'm not wrong no yeah and six okay so in order to include eight as well let's make it minus equal to the limit minus or equal and now it's all good but I would like them to be instantiated inside the parent. So after I can access it in the update state and make them blink. So I will create an empty uh, quad instant insta from instantiation parent. And uh, I will need to create public game object insta parent. So let's set uh, let's set uh, the parent new quad instance dot transform actually set parent oh tra sorry transform dot set parent insta parent dot transform and now this should actually let's uh, connect the insta parent there and now the quads should instantiate inside this game object and yes precisely we can see that they did now one thing that i would like for the quads to do is uh, to instantiate with a blinking uh, part uh, set off so new quad instance dot transform dot get child and uh, let's see which child is the blinking part i'm going to project in prefabs my quad so the blinking part it's child one because quad background would be child zero okay let's go back back to our script get child one dot game object I think that set active uh, false let's see how this goes okay now they're instantiated correctly so now all we have to do left is to create another method which is going to run in update and that's going to make uh, the quads blink so 
let's uh, create public void blink I would need a, a time a time reference uh, let's make a float public float uh, blink time for example so what do I want to do for each frame I'm going to loop through the list of my quads so for int i small equals to zero and it's smaller than insta parent insta parent dot transform dot child count so it will loop all the time through the insta parent now let's say I would also like to create a speed blink time and the speed before this happens all the time we need to update the blink time so let's uh, let's redo the same formula that uh, actually no no let's do another formula uh, blink time actually equals to math f dot move towards so my value I'm starting at zero blink time and the max value always which it would be limit in this case I want to use limit yes and we should uh, actually start at minus eight so in start I will equalize blink time equals with the origin so blink time will go from minus 8 to plus 8 limit on with a speed multiplied with time dot delta time okay so far so good so we do have a float variable that is going to from minus 8 to 8 with a respective speed now I'd like it to blink when I would like it to blink if I if I equals equals is similar with the int result int blink time then let's activate it so the same way we deactivated it let's uh, activate it so I'm going to my quad let's see so insta parent dot transform dot get child I dot transform we will need to get the other child as well that get child one dot transform dot no actually I think at game object dot set active true and all the other ones now okay else Now we will do the reverse with all the other ones. Else if int e is different. This operator here means different. Let's it set active false. So let's see how this goes. We would also need to reset. So if blink time limit plus zero one no limit plus one let's see how that happened how that works 
if or no no just limit and we will uh, correct it after but i think it's going to give an error so if blink time is when limit when blink time will set will be set back to the origin okay so we are running it in update blink and let's see what errors do we get all right what is the parent no the speed the speed should be of one and we do have an okay oh yes i know why okay so it should go from the origin so the blinking time it should go from zero to eight yes from zero to eight in this very case uh blink time equals zero i will delete this And the limit it's all right. No. The limit should be transform child count. No. And let's uh, give it a higher speed. Yep. So this would be the desired effect that I was going for and it is achieved with a for loop. So yes, it's it may seem a bit complicated, but through investigation uh, everything gets solved and this is proper use of, of a for loop. We will make more exercises like this. In the next videos uh, we will uh, learn about lists and arrays and uh, they will simplify things somehow and on the other side they will complicate it a bit more but uh, well it is all good training for our final purpose so i will see you in the next video goodbye hello so continuing from the previous video now before we adventure ourselves uh, any further i'd like to i'd like to make a, a brief comment we are almost uh, finish, going to finish the learning the most basic notions of uh, game development with Unity. But some of this uh, basic stuff, it's actually very perplexing and vexing when it comes to explaining it. So with that in mind, I think the best way to understand it is a lot of practice uh, and also a lot of investigation. We do have search engines and uh, for example, if you'd like uh, to check out in instantiate to how to instantiate something or anything at all, there is a big uh, community and you can find a lot of material and uh, learn new methods and uh, it never ends. We just need time. <laughs> so, yes, uh, I do encourage you all the time to go and check, uh, check out how other developers work and uh, of course, investigate if you, something is not clear. Uh, now, for example, here I I forgot to mention it yesterday. I was trying to get the int value out of a float. Uh, this will be always the, the integer. So, for example, I'm actually going to comment everything. I made a previous test. Okay. So, for example, if I would like to get a print uh, get the int out of the float 455. Uh, it would be 4. And uh, print, for example, the integer out of uh, 3.33. So it, it will never round up to 5, for example. And uh, that helped me in order to synchronize the lights so that they were going conforming 
relatively to time and speed. Uh, okay, well, uh, having said that, commented it everything, we can go and delve into our new adventure. Actually, there is just a small thing left to learn and uh, actually to comment. And we are going to uh, work on a more detail on uh, our next uh, practice. So let's do that. And uh, in the next video, I'm, I'm thinking that we should do uh, an exercise and maybe start a new project. And so I wanted to explain you about lists. Well, a list is actually it what it is, a list of objects, of integers, of, uh, of anything that we can use, we, of any variable that is defined within Unity. Also, an array is very similar to a list, or actually a list is very similar to an array. And uh, they do have similar functions, however, an array consumes less memory. But we can't actually modify the size of an array at runtime. And that's why sometimes it's better to, or easier to use lists. They are more handier. However, if we, we would have a list with 40,000 game objects, well, that would be a problem at runtime, I think. And an array could manage that m much, uh, much better. So with that in mind, if, for example, uh, in all these uh, previous examples that we did, we would have used the lists. We could have uh, really made much, much shorter this line, this whole line here that uh, was a mess in order to get, uh, I think, to get it to, to uh, similar with a blink. So, okay, let's uh, see how we define a list. I will, I will make them all public, public list and I would like to have an int list no public list int my new int list okay so let's see if it appears yes so now here we could say that its size is of 20 or 200 ah Okay, here we go. And the element zero of that list have a value of one, and the element 112 has a value of 22456. So if I'd like to get that element over there, I'd simply print my new int list. And in square brackets, we give it the index of the element and it was 12, if I'm not mistaken. So it should print out 22, 4, 5, 6. No, element 12, no, 112. Precisely. So this is very useful lists and arrays are very useful with for loops. So I could make this list, for example, a game object list. My new Now, uh, this works very well if I want the list to uh, update it manually in the inspector. However, if I want to update it uh, with code, there is something that we need to do. My new int list equals new list int. And this is just a formula that always has to be done. But uh, for example, as I said before, if I want to update it manually, it's all right. Okay, now let's uh, add an array as well. Now, how do we declare an array? Well, public int, for example, an array of ints and uh, with square brackets, my int 
array equals and here I can uh, okay I can add uh, the info I would like okay let's go back to the list let's close it my and precisely my entire it is shown there and declared if I would like not to declare here it would be equals new int and uh, here the numbers of um, the number of uh, elements it should have seven well it does have seven elements uh, allow me to start again it, it's not refreshing properly so I will delete this public int sum int and precisely it did update it it has seven elements and they are all set to zero and I can set them uh, whatever I would like so now that we have these notions as I said I think we we can move further and after this practice uh, I think we could go and uh, start moving objects and uh, see what else is out there however as I said I think these are very essential things and we uh, we will always meet with them um, okay well see you in our next video goodbye hello uh, welcome to the finals of the beginning of our course so let's uh, start our practice I'm going to create a new project 2d and I'm going to name it practice uh, essentials and click create project so I have prepared a, a small test given an int array find a pair of numbers from the array such that the sum of a pair is equal to a specified number so yes for example if we have an array from 1 to 9 and we give a number 14 I think uh, it should return 9 plus 5 for example B similarly to the first problem but now instead of a pair we have triplets and we are going to list all solutions for both of them and I'm going to add C because I actually found it better is to start with C uh, create a graphic representation of the array uh, it's going to be a fixed array like uh, 3 by 3 or 10 by 10 actually all arrays in unity they, uh, this kind of arrays are line linear arrays they are not in two or three dimensions but we can give them a graphic representation if we would like to and actually it helps us better to understand the logic of what we are doing I, 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 I think so so having said that let's see if a project is loading oh, okay here we are so it's an empty 2d project so let's begin with the beginning I'm going to create a folder call it resources I'm going to move a scene folder inside it I'm also going to create another folder call it scripts and I will quickly create a script and call it app manager I will open it now I will also need uh, an object inside unity which will run this script so I will create an empty and call it game manager or app manager or CEO whatever whatever you'd like uh, app manager I will call it the name of a script but it has no importance uh, now that we let me quickly rename the scene as well so rename it uh, arrays and lists oh no practice okay and I'll reload it now let's take care of the other important stuff I'm going to go to lightning environment and set the ambient color to white and um, let's create a text because yes I would like to have a console actually we'll do our practice in unity's console but at the end 
maybe we can uh, give it a polish and a nice graphic representation depending on on the time so let's see i'm going to create a text ui a simple text and i will call it ri text now what else let's go to the canvas it should be in screen space camera and let's drag the main camera inside and uh, set the plane distance to one. Oh, and very important the canvas color should be set to scale with screen size and the reference the resolution well I, I usually use a uh, full HD 1920 with 1080 and so far so good I would also like the background to be darker okay maybe slightly more yeah something like this and let's see what happens with the array text okay it's in the left bottom corner let's move it and let's change its color to white just so we can see it or actually you know an electric blue now if I would be to resize it with R well, we can see it's kind of blurry and pixelated so I'm going to go back and here comes very handy the rec tool press F Whoop. Ah, zooming out again so this would be my console where I'm going to show VR and I'm just gonna modify the text size okay and I'm going to center it all right so i think i'm going to press ctrl s to save it back to i did not create my app manager okay let's create quickly an app manager create it empty and let's drag the script all right so let's go with it I'm going to delete all this so I do have a structure for it uh, let's start by adding a comment variables used for functionality so we will you will need the array itself uh, public int given array equals to we'll start with something simple from from one to nine and i would like to draw it like one two three four five six and another row seven eight nine now we will need uh, another in for the given number and I think that's it what we need for functionality now let's make another one variables needed to draw the array or for to give it a graphic representation I'm going to leave it like this so we are we are going to need a, a helper and uh, you will see in a moment why and uh, it's going to be a string public string uh, drawing whoops now as we do have a text so we should be using unity engine dot ui and now I can add another row variables needed to for the user interface and uh, I will add a public text array text now in order to create a function to draw I will also need a boolean public bool uh, start drawing 
whoops not function bool and yes we are set to go let's create the function of actually drawing vri so public void start drawing my array we do have to be careful with the names because some methods are uh, are internal to uh, unity's uh, way of working and functioning but i doubt that uh, this is an uh, a function that that's internal to unity um, okay so back to it In, uh, we do need one more thing to draw the array because i want to separate it in rows and columns so we do need an int public int columns and another public int rows so in update we should uh, say like whenever we click and activate this public bool it should start drawing my array so in update we said if start drawing equals equals to true then start drawing my array okay and now uh, stick with me for a bit. I will explain the functionality in a moment. Let's, uh, I'd like to, for once I would like, uh, for starters, I would like to print each number by using uh, the rows and the columns. So the formula should be like this, for int i smaller than uh, the columns and inside another four tab tab four tab tab and now i'll just press j and tab again so for int i smaller than the columns and for int j smaller than the rows print well, let's print it in the console what should we print the given array and its position uh, or its value corresponding to its pos uh, to each position so given array position should be i multiplied with columns plus j so if, for example it, it should print from one to nine but let's uh, modify this and you see in a moment that it's going to give us some trouble uh, I will uh, set it to 33 so we do know if this is working properly my first print should be 33 app manager now you'll see that even if I modified oh actually it modified this time let's see if it's working I have made a previous test and I encountered of the most troubling problems with arrays uh, okay so rows 3 columns three and start drawing okay and it never stops all right great it's working so we need to do one more thing after it draws the array let's set start drawing to false so it it won't uh, draw it forever let me modify this back to one Control s curious if it modifies no now it did not modify even if I uh, I set it here back to one, I'm not sure why. Uh, it's maybe an internal error from Unity. It uh, well, things uh, do tend to happen, but we do have investigation of of a very powerful tool. For example, when I first started Unity, the version that we were working on, uh, it would not allow you to name uh, colors only with capital letters. Otherwise, everything would uh, would be would be crashing. So yes, things like that do pop out from time to time. But as I said, methods and investigation, uh, all, they always help us out. Okay, uh, let me set it from here, rows three, columns three. And uh, let's see what we can do with this. We do have a helper because I would like my helper when it comes here. So drawing helper which is a string uh, should be equal 
with itself plus give an array i multiplied it by columns plus j plus a space so we have them a, a bit uh, separated so now i think if at the end of this i will print my drawing helper we would have all the numbers given here so we will we would be precisely where we began from actually i don't need the parentheses drawing print yes drawing do need all right start drawing yeah precisely so we have them uh, nicely separated there now uh, this formula is just uh, it's a basic formula and for example we can check whenever i is zero so we will only print for example the first loop i it's at zero j it's at zero it will print the position zero one then inside this j will go on towards rows uh, maximum towards three actually it will never reach three so it will print uh, it will be one printing one and then it will be two and it will print be printing the second position which in our case has the value of three and so forth so now there is another formula I, which i would like because once so once i printed the first line then i would start on the on the columns on the second line so here it's a formula to skip a row drawing helper equals drawing helper plus and uh, is this backslash n i think yes in a previous project i used the other slash and that was a headache uh okay so let's uh, let's test it now we should actually visualize it correctly in this console and i'm pressing i'm clicking here and i can see them correctly here uh okay so now let's pause it in app manager i would like to add the array text I don't care to so the RI text should be actually here I can do it at the end of this function so RI text dot text should be equal to RI text dot text maybe I want to add something uh, else in the array so that's why plus another let's keep another row plus uh, a drawing helper okay and let's see how that goes if everything works correctly i should have new text skipping a row yeah precisely so so far so good so let's uh let's see how we do the other function public void uh sum um how should we call it i i always find uh so much trouble when in naming my my functions uh function one and that's it uh okay so for function one how would we go about it so we do have a given number so i could go through all my ri so four. Uh, in order to get the length of an array, actually it's pretty simple. Given array dot length, and then we would need to actually loop again through the array. Int j tab. Given array true dot length. 
oops, here. And let's add another Boolean for functionality. So uh, public bool. But I would, uh, yeah, no, I, let's add. I would prefer to add it uh, down here so I have them all all here. But uh, never mind. Let's add it here because normally we, we, we wouldn't be using it like this. We'd create a button and so forth. So public bool function one. So in update, I will say if function one equals equals to true. I named it wrong for my first function because uh, a boolean, a variable, and a function can't have the same name. So if my first function equals equals to true, do that respective function, function one, and when it finished, set it to false so it won't do it again. All right, so uh, here we would need an if. If given a number equals equals, it is precisely the same of the sum of a given array i plus whoops plus given array j do this array text array text dot text equals to plus uh, given number found by summing or adding uh, plus given array okay and actually I think I have it saved yes plus given array J plus Okay, and so this <laughs> should give us an error. Now, why it should give us an error? Because it would find the same number twice. It would uh, add, uh, for example, we are looking for number 14, and uh, it will uh, sum 9 with 5, and after it, or 5 with 9 first, and after 9 with 5. Uh, but uh, let, let's just see how it is going so let's uh i don't need to draw vr actually let's uh give it a uh, given number 14 actually my first function given number found by adding five and nine given number found by adding six and eight okay let's number found by adding eight and six precisely uh it is repeating all uh, all of them if i would be to change the text size here we can read them uh, but no uh, no uh, and uh, you you will see why for this we would need a list in order to to do this and i should actually add another line of separation plus n And uh, for functionality, we'll need a public list of ints. My uh, 
repass list repassing numbers 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 equals to new list int we could uh, do this in starter here I prefer it to do it here so it, it should work it always have to be equal to a new list so uh, now let's see how we would uh, take care of that let me just check uh, I wouldn't want the video to be too long so now we should do another if actually here by adding here we should add the found the number found by both these numbers we should be adding them to the list of repassed numbers because they already passed through that number so in order to add something in a list repassing numbers dot add we will add this one okay and I will repeat on this line and we will also add the J1 and here if given number equals to that and also in order to to say this so I'm going to put a double condition in here and we can do this like that and repassing numbers no I'm, I'm, I'm sorry uh, we do need uh, another for loop so I do have them inside the given array i and j now once I do have them in there for we do need a for and I'm going to create yet another bool or no we can do have a, a simple bool here that will only so for example here is how we create a temporary bool, bool uh, temp bo boolean or temp bool that actually uh, imp uh, you will see in a minute uh, in a moment what it does bool temp bool so for int uh, p or q which is smaller than the length actually than the count this is a main uh, main uh, difference between uh, arrays and uh, lists the lists have a count which is actually its maximum length and the arrays have a length so for int q if repassing numbers equals given array i or this is a, a sign for or repassing number q equals given array dot j okay I need to close the parenthesis here my temp bool actually you know what no let's uh let's make it properly it's a bool for functionality uh, very public bool past numbers or past number numbers that ha have already passed past that passed into the list numbers past numbers equals to true now here if the given number equals to that and if past number is not true equals to false so the numbers are not found in the repassing numbers list then yes the array text can say given number was found 
by adding so let's uh, let's give it a try now here at the end of this function I would need to clear the list repassing number dot clear this is good practice many I think uh, in our case the code would work even if we are not clearing it and pass numbers equals to false okay so let's see how it goes let's put a welcome to the console a smaller font okay give a number I said uh, 14 let's see why it's not finding oh yes precisely pass numbers equal to false after it passes that here we have to to set it to false because it would it would not allow for uh, six and eight or all the others that would go so let's give it another go okay ha huh. and we should uh, yet add another another uh, uh, condition here and and if given so I, I don't want it to show me seven by seven uh, seven plus seven I different Given all right J. Oh, and and now I think it should be working. Oh, let's give it a number. Precisely, and uh, it won't find uh, seven and seven. Okay, well, I will wrap it up here. Please try and make uh, a function with three variables yourselves. I will uh, also make it, and in the next video, let's maybe polish it a bit, and then we can go to something more exciting. Starting from uh, where we where we left the project, I thought about it, and uh, I think it's better that there is no confusion regarding lists and arrays so i will explain the, the function myself and uh, implement the second one also in uh, in this video so what we are doing here is we are looping two times through the same array and we do have a number and we do want to know if two numbers that are inside that array are the sum of the number in the case that they are we check here we say and that and we also check that the numbers are different from each other so because that's how the text wa test was enunciated so we check if the given number it's equal to the sum and if the numbers are different then we say yay we found the number and we created a list and are adding those numbers both of them to the list now when we go again through the array we are checking because the first time we are going I don't uh, mind this for because the list should be empty now we are going again through the loops and we are uh, uh, checking for the length of that list and if the value that it's encountered in each of that positions of that list is equal to the value any of the values that we are looping through here that are values found in VR, it means that those values already entered in this list. So we already added them, we, we already found that number using these two numbers. So we set it past numbers to true. That's why we are also checking here that uh, it is to false actually. And after we do the loop, the first 
for a loop at the end we set the past numbers to false so it can go so it could it can go again and check for other numbers well i hope uh, this explains it uh, what i'd like to do would be to clear the text when we start the function so uh, was my all right no all right text that text equals to this so we know it's it's clear i would also like to clear it when drawing and let's go implementing the second function i will copy the first function copy paste and i'll name it con uh, function 2 and here we will only need another bool actually i can press a comma my second function and here i will copy paste this and type it accordingly my second function okay so let's modify this function now i will need another loop because we are searching for triplets so another four int u smaller than precisely this it's more of the same but uh, with more checking and the loop should end here before before here all right so now we are looping through this and we need to add another condition here so that the repass numbers that actually the given number u it's not oh, we are repassing that neither the third uh, loop is actually encountered in our list I'll press and enter, we can see it clear. Okay, and here this line is going to be a bit longer. So the condition should be given number equals plus given array u. Let's go one more line. And we also need to check. So we are checking that the given number is the sum of all three of them. And that past numbers is false because they are not encountered in the list. And that given array i is different than given array j. And we need to copy paste this two more times. And here I will replace it with u. And here. so that never the number is the same okay we do have that and uh, in the text we need to add another end or with what i'm going to end given r u so this should work let's see Oh, I messed up. <laughs> don't don't mind this. So uh, let's go. Well, my first function, I should give it a number. Okay, and let's see with the second function. Okay, and I think that there aren't any other results. So what I was trying to do is to make the array. Uh, size of a hundred but as you can see i actually set it back to i think it was 10 no nine from one to nine includingly uh okay so let me see if this will work it's new int and set it to a hundred and in our start four 
to 100 given Ri equals I plus 1. Now let's see how this works. So yeah, the problem is that uh, Unity does not read that I actually changed the script to to a given array the size of a hundred. So it's going to give me an error. For that purpose, I'm going to modify it manually. This would not happen with a list, but as I said before, arrays are uh, better to use memory-wise. So we are going from one to one hundred now. I will set here 10 and 10, so let's draw it. Okay, as we can see, yeah, there's a small problem here. We could actually do something to draw it properly from 1, or I could just say plus 11. Ten, ten. Okay, now we can see it accordingly, more or less. Now, another way I thought, and actually, why not? Let's do it with plus one. And I think in the drawing helper, plus n. Yes, I will use this. And I will say if is smaller or equal to 10, no, bigger than 10, do this because I like um, uh, how it's printing them. But if this value here else, else if given a is smaller, oh yeah, smaller than 10, let's put a double space. And uh, let's see how this looks. No, 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 no. Ten, ten. Even more of a space, I think, here. Okay, well, it's a, it's a matter of testing. Now what I would like for us to do would be to give it a, like some, some polishing. What we could do would be to make a, another script. Let, let's test this first. Oh, now it's too much. Uh, well, you, you get the idea. So uh, let's give it a number. Um, 100, for example. My first function. By adding all this, let's go into text. And the last one is 49 and 51. Let's go and use my second function. 1, 2, and 97, 3, 4, and so forth. Let's go into text. Yeah, precisely. So, okay, well, I think we achieved uh, what we wanted to. Now, I think a bit of polish with the... Uh, we could do uh, by using the for loops and uh, we could actually in the next uh, video just to to finish this well we could uh, make use of a for loop so we could say for my position here which it is then to create uh, a whole frame and so on and then to make it blink and may maybe making like a, a small mouth for the console so when it's thinking it should go from one side to another, like uh, old computers would do, or science fiction computers. Uh, all right, then I will see you in the next video. Back to our practice project. So I think just before we we finished uh, the other video, uh, here in drawing uh, the array, I think it was only set to smaller than 10. No, it should be set to smaller or equal to 10, because otherwise it won't print the 10 when we draw it. So let me just quickly check it. It should be more organized now. Draw, 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 draw. The array. Okay. And uh, just for the sake of it, we can uh, give it a best fit.
here and we more or less they do fit accordingly all right I'm, I'm going to stop this so I I created a script I'm going to call it I called it decorations manager it is empty so I was thinking to do something similar with a blinking quad but uh, a bit more sophisticated so for that I'm going to create a folder called materials and another folder called prefabs inside materials folder set one more actually set and uh, color okay and I will duplicate this in order to have two different sets I, I wanted to bring in two ideas of how we could uh, implement uh, something to dazzle the eye but of course there is an infinity of possibilities however I try to implement these two and uh, well from here I I think you there are enough notions so you could do whatever you'd like uh, with the notions that we have until now uh, it would be easier to use uh, sprites I think if uh, anybody's a good artist so let's go with it I will also create an empty call it deck manager I will assign the script to it well what am I doing oh, okay deck manager and so now what I had in mind for a first method I need two types of quads one for the corners and uh, one for the sides uh, and one for the sides that are going down because we uh, did not learn rotation until uh, rotations until now but we'll uh, learn them in the next steps uh, so I'm going to rush a bit because I usually tend uh, to get obsessive with with these things and we'll never hear the end of it so I'm going to create an empty I'm going to uh, position a reference coin and I will try not to be so precise I'd like to place it just right above this corner and zero it on Z inside it I should create a quad I'm going to use the rec tool okay so the corner quads would be made out of two pieces and I think by the end of this video you you will see why I'm going to duplicate it make it just like this and uh, I am interested in the scale it has on X in order to paste the scale on Y on the other one uh, why because they need to align if I'm going to use the same type of prefabs when instantiating it all right, so this would be the background quads. BG from background. And I need something more. Let's add a material. Set one. Mm, shoot. Quad, quad. Now, if I'm trying to drag it in here, let's see if it took it. Maybe I was lucky. No, it only took one. Only one of them took the material. So by adding it on the right side, they will both get the material. So what I wanted. Dark gray. Wait. Oh, I will uh, move the position slightly I prefer it to get out of the camera frame that we can see here rather than uh, uh, have an empty space there all right so we do have a quads uh, let me just quickly create a light a point light I will uh, zero it on Z and I'll bring it here 
Now, let's give it a bit minus one. And the range, it should be really small. And let's alter the material a bit. Normally in uh, 2D games, uh, lights aren't so used. Now it depends on the game. But uh, as I previously said, uh, uh, a good artist could do as 10,000 lights could, <laughs> could not. So maybe the reflections. Let's move it a bit. So the lights will the light will be moving. Actually, it will be teleporting. We haven't done any movement until now. So it will pop. pop. All right. So I can live with this with with this so far. I'm going to turn off the lights. Now I would like to have some rays. So I'd like to create something LED-like. Creating a quad. I'll place it on minus zero, not zero one. And place it here. Now, I'll duplicate it and one more time. Okay, so this three quads should have this material. I'm scrolling down, adding the color, and I'm gonna need to make him also a darker gray. Let's turn on the light. I will actually have more lights. I want to get uh, an idea of it. So. Yeah, let's let it be more smooth. So now we need to do the same for the upper part. Okay, rotating it. I have just duplicated it. Okay. Well, as, as I said, it's not rocket science, so nobody's going to die if we don't uh, put it precisely here. By all means, you please take the time and uh, position them precisely. But uh, for the point of, uh, of this video, I'm, I will stop here and not try to, not try so hard. Okay, so now I'd like for M to have some uh, light simulation. Lights sim. Two of them, actually. Uh, I'm going to delete the other one. So the light sim should be quads. Let's place it on minus 0 0.02F. So as you can see, I'm uh, playing with height here in order to uh, height towards the camera or distance towards the camera in order to represent them properly. Okay, one. So this would be my LEDs. Still too big. Control D, Control D, Control D. Okay. Control D again. So 
So when I will go through the list, this corner should light uh, first one part and then the other to create a, a more smoother transition. For that purpose, I'm going to uh, try and duplicate this. Ninety. I'm going to delete this one. Okay, so my lights are ready. Now, so this would be the children zero, one, two, three, and four. And it will go like uh, from one part to the other, it will go like this. So let me check. Okay. So they are in the correct order. This one should, li should light first. Because I would like to go clockwise with a lot of rotation in the lightning. And uh, now let's create, uh, actually, I'm going to rename this. Uh, corner quad and uh, let's create a side quad one create an empty side quad oh one thing the lights should actually have this material which I'm going to alter color free and color free so now if for example I'm making them red uh, okay well uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not going to make them emissive I'm not going to make them metallic very be plain quads okay so uh, I will uh, uh, repeat the same operation for for the longitudinal quad for the side quad let me see where it is I will zero it on Z and I'll place it up in this corner here. And inside it, I will create a quad. And this quad should be same dimensions on the Y axis as this one. Control F. Wait. Okay. Now we should wait in, in a perfect aligning. Okay, side quad. And what I am interested I'll duplicate this I will take it to my side quad so this would be BG line and I would want some lights as well and I'm going to make the lights the first lights the first children I'm going to copy this three or four quads control D I'm going to put them inside the lights of my side quad I'm 
and why are there four quads okay one two three and four okay well so far so good but so i don't need quad 16 not nor quad 15 So I have a I have a misclick somewhere. That's why it's always better to to use code. I'm going to delete this one. Okay, so we got it going for now. D and Control D. Okay. So now the background should have this color. And I do have lines. Uh, okay, well, I I think we are ready to start writing the code. I will stop this video here, and uh, I will be back uh, uh, with uh, with the coding part. Uh, see you in a bit. Hello again. So back from where we left off. I have done some investigations, and we have a bit more of setting up to do. So I'm going to make space here. And uh, let me hide what we don't need. I'm going to hide the canvas for now. So I will center on the corner quad. This would be the top left quad. Top left corner. Now, an important detail that we need to do is to reposition the lights. Why? Because I would like the lights parents, the light parent to be in the middle here. And now I'm going to open it, select all the lights and uh, set them back where they belonged. Uh, why am I doing this? Because uh, I'm going to create a, like a, a parent for the actual point light that is going to navigate above them. And I'm going to align it with the light parent. So I'm going to do the same for the other lights for the other light quads to put it so to separate it in order to reduce confusion. I know it may be confusing right now. And I'm going to do the same for the side quad. And I'm going to select all the other lights. As you remember with shift clicking, holding shift and I selected them all. Okay, more, uh, more or less. So now, uh, I found it better that we should actually create prefabs for all of the corners. So this one here should be minus 90 or 270 W. This would be the top right corner. And uh, let's duplicate it. Oops. Control D. It doesn't matter where it is positioned right now because we are going to save them. And we are going to do some tests, investigating how uh, better to fit them. Uh, bottom right corner. And I'm going to duplicate it. Control D. And on the 9. I will write 90 here. Yes. And this would be bottom left corner. And we will also need a side quad 2 or perpendicular. And I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees. Uh, no, actually this would work well for the left side. Perpendicular, rename it. Left. Because I keep the pivot point aligned to the camera frame. 
and uh, I will duplicate it perpendicular right and it should be if I'm not mistaken to minus 90 okay and then the side quad this one should be side quad top I'm going to duplicate it and I'm going to rotate it and name it side quad bottom 180 I think yes this should do all right perpendicular left this one and perpendicular right this one okay let's save our prefabs oh no let's uh, let's try something first i would like to create the lights prefab as well so i'm going to create a quad just to help myself so i'm going to place it here and uh, I would like the lights to be distributed, uh, let's see, point light, one. I'm going to zero it on X, zero. Now, something like this maybe, and the point light, it should be zeroed. Also, zero, zero. The scale. It, it doesn't matter, it is a light. Uh, to the quad, I'm interested in getting rid of the mesh renderer and of the mesh collider. Actually, I don't need the mesh collider for any of the quads, but uh, it won't bother us right now. Uh, I will keep the mesh renderer just a bit in order to position the point light. Okay, I'm going to duplicate it here and here and here okay so we do have one so this should be light one I, I would actually like to do two types of lights uh, one blue and one red and uh, we are going to learn a new form formula in order to modify the lights uh, the lights color and the material color by script it's nothing very complicated and uh, it should be taking as it is. Uh, so let me quickly turn off the mesh render on both of them. So let's turn on the lights, see what happens. Okay. All right, so something like that, it should go. I actually did not need two of these prefabs, but uh, it's, it's better to have them. So let's save everything. Lights one, lights two. Cool. I'm going to select everything that I need and try and drag it. You can see that I can't. When creating prefabs, we have to create them from uh, one by one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, yes, it's all right. I'm going to delete them. So let's go back in uh, the manager. So I would need game objects. All the prefabs that I, that I created, they're game objects. So top corner left, top corner right bottom bottom corner right side up side down lights 
one, light two, or blue and red. So I know when I'm instantiating them. So now let's start and uh, play around. So I would say four int i int smaller than I don't know. Uh, let's just type uh, something here. Actually, it would be good to rename the prefabs one, once we instantiate them. Uh, so let's let's create an int public int numer id no public int length the id I'm going to add it and it, this is bad naming my length it should be called all right so for i smaller than my length what should you do if i equals equals zero then do the following i also need a game object which would be a position reference so back into unity i'm going to get that position reference which i would like to be precisely this corner and i'm going to create it inside this manager the decoration manager and f again let's place it around here okay in the deck manager i'm going to assign everything i'm going to start with a length of 20 no f yes 20 just to check when I need uh, to to turn, so I would uh, instantiate other type of uh, of pieces. So top corner left, top top top, top left corner. Oops. Top corn, top right corner, bottom corner, bottom left, bottom right. I forgot about side up, side down, side left, side right. Back to the deck manager. Okay, now I remember them. Side up. The second was side bottom, right. Now, uh, we do not have so many quads, so maybe it would have been easier already to copy paste them and uh, make the environment ourselves. But imagine we would have maybe 20,000 of this. So in, in this case, if we would have 20,000, uh, that's why we're doing this, to learn the methods and and to apply them whenever needed. So if i equals zero, then what I would like to instantiate, the top corner left, game object, new top left equals instantiate top corner left. Now top corner left dot transform that position equals to reference position reference transform that position now if I different from zero now game object side up new side up i can put any name here equals instantiate side up 
now side up that transform that position new no 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 new top left because i was trying to to move something that i was instantiating uh it's it, it would be wrong so what we are trying to move is uh, the new game object not the one that we have saved so new top left here and uh, new side up here that transform that position equals to well it should be a new vector free and i made them one unit and i know that my position actually ends around here the first one so it should be the reference position plus i plus one so uh, let let me just uh, and just show you what i mean a uh, new vector free and i need to give it the position on x we're starting uh, position reference transform position dot x plus one plus i and the other position is unchanged on uh, y and i'm going to write it down transform that position that no position reference dot y and uh, i don't even think i need to give it a z as we are working in 2d so let's leave it like this it should be zero so let's see what happens. Uh, yes, what I said that I would like to actually name them. Them so new top left dot transform dot name equals i. Whoops. To string and here new side up. side to string so let's see what happens now okay it's starting where it should but I'm giving it too much of a so not I added plus one I think it's less than one let's just make sure how uh, I'm going to create a quad. Oh, I created it wrong. Ooh. I'm going to take something else it was with a scale of one. I'm gonna zoom on it. I'm gonna zoom on the other one then now selecting the first one and if i remember correctly it was something like this or zero zero eight so yeah around uh, zero dot nine i should have to okay what i was interested in is when when do we have to what number do we get here 16 so from uh, 15 we don't need the 15 anymore Okay, now. If I equals, whoa, equals equals 15. I will copy this. It's going to be new, new top right. new top right top corner right and my position in this case is going to be the same as this one so new vector free 
only it's not going to be plus one it's going to be plus two so we said actually that we are going to put it plus eight seven five f okay now if equals 50 if okay and in here it'll say if i is smaller than 50. now if i is bigger than 15 it should start insta instantiating the side which side the side right game object new side right instantiates side right now the position on the x because i'm instantiating the right side here or or here to put it so it's going to be the same that the corner had so let's go back in here so let's see how uh, our vector free would look yes we would have to actually replace this with the y f plus y plus i minus 15 if i'm not wrong if i'm not mistaken we would have to uh, to plan c so my position here and we said it's going to be two. I have gambled before and tried uh, different values. Uh, this is not the best way to do it, but it is the simpler way to do it. Uh, but yes, as you can see, it uh, it takes some time. So let's see how it uh, how it goes. Game of genius side right. Uh, okay. So it went bad. At least it went good until here. Until 14. 15 is this one. Well, let's see what happens here. So it's different RAM zero and different than fifteen. Just to to be sure. And I is different than fifteen. Yes, well no, not position reference, but the position reference of my new top right on y so i'm going down on y well let's calculate it it's easier to calculate position reference here it's the mistake it should be plus 15 i think so plus 17 85 i i think so and uh here yes here it's uh it it should be all right i think the list it, it's going up okay 
so not 17 but 16 and uh, i minus 15 no let's go with i No, they are all here. Oh, of course. My goodness. Uh, I, I will stop the video here, uh, start investigating some more and uh, come back to you with the finish of a project. So back from where we left off. Well, what I was doing here wrong. Uh, it was that I was doing I minus 13 dot, uh, 15 before. Well, after researching, like I investigated around half an hour and came with the uh, correct numbers. They do not seem to make much logic. Uh, why? Because uh, we did not make actually equal sides. And uh, when we are rotating them and with a pivot thing, uh, well we do we do get some errors uh, however i cheated a bit and uh, in some places i in order for them to not have uh, spaces well i selected the for example this part here and i scaled it a bit or of my liking or, or what i needed to adjust to so let's see how uh, how it got out Okay, so it's more or less aligned. This part it was easier because uh, it sh it should have the same uh, position of as the position reference. So in future, I think an easier way it would be to use uh, position references for all the corners, or just make sure that uh, or use units or scale the camera in uh, such way, and uh, not only maybe I could have used proper units and uh, not this space here because uh, this space is actually gave a gave a big headache anyway so this is a way to doing doing what well we are set i'm going to upload the code and the project files so now we are set to add all of this to a list so i'm going to copy everything so this is the code if you'd like to look at it i think we stopped here in the previous video then I had to research the next one and uh, place all the conditions. It uh, it was very boring, so I doubt to it uh, was worth recording. But uh, yes, sometimes uh, boring activities are part of of a uh, game development. So let's create a function: public void creating the frame. Control K, Control D, and I will copy paste it here. And I will need public list um, game object my um, my quads. and my light objects and uh, in start let's make my quads equals to new game object and uh, my lights because I'm actually interested not in the quads but in the lights while the quads carry my lights equals to new okay tab and it auto completes it so here i need to add uh, my quads whoops dot add new side up okay so i need to do this for all of the parts and uh, just get the correct name new side right yeah 
new side down. And the same goes for the corners. And I will also put the same conditions. If I, I will need to add uh, other children. Mm, new top left. New top right. New bottom right and the last one. Well, if I didn't make any mistakes, this should work and we should have a proper list. Now let's execute this in start as well, uh, creating the frame. Okay, and let's see how it goes. All right, so my quads, yes, and they are in order now i do need to get the lights from him i do know that the corners have the lights at child zero one two three and four in this order three and four okay and the other ones have the lights at child zero so now i will create another function i will get rid of this i'll minimize it public void creating lights list all right so for my quads that count and we need to place the conditions I will have to reopen this if I zero fifteen. Okay, but it's a uh, it's a good thing that uh, this will repeat. I am just copying that to work faster, and I'm going to delete this, and delete everything. So or else, actually no. In this case, if I different when 37 and I is different than 22, I is different than 15, I is different than zero and do the next thing and I missed an end okay so if I zero then uh, my lights should add add child uh, my quads zero in this case but i'm just going to type uh, i so we can use it for the other transform at a uh, child get child we said uh, three and four okay And the fourth one. Same here, same here, and here. Otherwise, my child get child zero. So let's see how uh, how this goes. I would need to call this creating 
creating lights list. Okay, so I only want to create it in start. Then in update we are going to loop it. I shall press play. Deck manager, so we do have a quads list of 44 and the lights of 48, correct. And they are in the proper order. All right, finally, we got a point of... So let's uh, create a... Now I do have 48 items, yes, so... I will put a limit, public float limit, and uh, speed as well. And I will add two colors. We can actually do this, public color, my color, or we could make a list of colors, my color. Okay, public color. I will just. I want to use red and blue. Color red. We could actually initialize it from script as well, but I would like for you to see it in a, in a, the inspector. Color blue. Okay, so yes, let's. We were going to do the loop. So I will uh, create uh, another function, public void, loop, lights. So inside here I will have a counter. This could be actually a limit, but no, uh, let's make another public float, a timer. So time, timer equals time equals itself plus time dot delta time speed now if timer this is the same as using the speed when uh, w I, I will explain it in a bit if timer is bigger or equals the limit which should be 48, then timer should be reset to zero. All right, so we have that. Now for okay, how would you call it? My lights, my lights dot count if int oops timer equals equals my lights i no equals equals i then my lights i not set active i dot set active true else if Or just else, it it uh, it should work. Else, my lights. Active false. Oh, okay. So, I doubt I'm calling the loop. No, I'm not calling it. In update, loop lights. And also in the beginning, let's uh, actually set all the lights to, well, uh, set them inactive. 
So for highlights dot count. Wait to it with a, another capital. Okay, we could create another function for this, but no, it's uh, it's no need. So now uh, let's try loop light. Okay. And it stopped at zero. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, because the speed is set at zero. Let's close this. No speed, let's set it to 10 and we'll limit to 48. All right, so now we have this. Now what we need to do is to add another blue light that would go precisely opposite to this and, uh, and then add the lights themselves to follow this. So uh, I would like for you to try and uh, write the code yourself, document it, and uh, I will come uh, with a resolution in the next video. All right then, uh, I will, I'll see you in a bit. Hi again, congrats on getting this far. I hope you're enjoying the tutorial and already starting to see awesome results. If you want to see the extended version of the course, head to skillademia.com where you will find our full Unity Beginner to Advanced course with more than 60 lectures and many more projects to complete. Now, let's continue. Hello, so continuing from where we stopped in the previous video, uh, I actually saw that I had an error around here. I forgot to add that I should be different from 37 as well. Now in this case it's not really an error because we are specifying it here as well. But it's good to add uh, as many variables as possible, not to overcharge it, but uh, in order to identify errors. Uh, because if there is, there is a problem this will, will help. And most of the times there will be a problem. Uh, <laughs> not trying to get uh, your hopes down. But yes, it is part of the investigation. So let's see how our, our loop, uh, looping lights look. So what I'd like to do uh, is to add a second light that should be instantiated here or start here and go the other way around. I'll stop this. I will uh, add a limit of 48. So because I know that I do have 48 lights and a speed of 10. I know that I have 48 lights because they are written here. So I know that that position over there would be the 24th position. So what I would actually like to do would be to activate this one as well, I plus 24. Now how we have our code structure, we activate the lights and then we turn them all off that are not equal to i. So we we would need another loop and it, uh, the order of execution does matter. We should actually turn off all the other lights and then just set, uh, set on uh, the right ones. So I'm going to copy this again and uh, I'm going to paste it down here. And here I will activate them. So I will only delete this because this one is okay. Now I will s replace this with J because uh, I need to use another variable. Actually, I'm, I'm not sure if I, I don't need to use another variable because I'm only using it inside this loop, but uh, just not to create confusion. So this I actually don't need, this I don't need and I would say because this j and i are the same variable. So here I'm saying that if my timer is different than j, that the light, uh, the light uh, 
ID to put it so or place inside the loop of the list if it is different than J because J is going from 0 to the limit of the list which is 48 set active false so here I'm, I am setting all of them to false this I can delete and I will close the if statement set active false not with a capital F so now I set them all to false and here I'm activating what I want it to be active now of course there will be an error and you'll see in a moment because we need another if statement so we are going and around here it is an error why because it's going actually higher than the size of a collection so here we can simply say if i plus 24 smaller than 48 48 then do this now i will add an else if else if i plus 24 is bigger than 48 and I do not have it then which light should I activate it would be I minus 24 so when uh, yes precisely whenever if I plus 24 is bigger than 48 so the first time it means it would, I should be 25 so we would get 49 so 25 minus 24 we would have to activate the first light so now this should work properly let's double check just in case precisely we get no error now regarding uh, our lights color and the lights itself let's uh, configure the colors here now when we declare a color in uh, in the inspector it comes with an alpha of zero by default i'll change it to 100 percent and change it to red reddish and do the same with this one the alpha okay to 100 percent and change it to blue Ish. so now in my project I, I don't actually really need to have them uh, from here because uh, well this way i can instantiate them but do i want to instantiate them we are only talking about two lights so let's take a shortcut i'll actually place them outside wherever lights one lights two it doesn't matter which is which but just to get uh, actually lights red yeah let's make the first one so lights one where lights one but now i'm using the ones outside so i don't need to instantiate them anymore and uh, well they can just stay in the scene it doesn't matter so what I would like for them to do is to have the same place. Uh, if you remember, we moved the physical lights uh, pivot. So I'm taking this outside. We moved it in the center. So these are the children that we are actually having in our lights list. So this red light and blue light that I have here, the variables, that's how I named them. I want them actually to get in the center correspondingly so I will delete this and okay let's go to it so my lights I then red light lights red dot transform dot position should be equal to my lights i dot transform dot position so far so good in the other case my lights blue no blue lights or lights blue i think i used the nomenclature lights blue on that position should be equal equal my lights i 
plus 24 dot transform dot position and I will do the same in the other case I minus 24 and now the lights should follow should follow our should teleport to the respective parts of uh, of a frame we are in so yes indeed we can see that there but I think there is a problem and the problem is that there the position on Z is set to zero because we just equalized the position to zero so in order to change the position to a minus okay let's let's check again all right so I will slightly now if I remove was it something like this we can see a soft light in there so let's see actually what configurations I would like to do point light so yeah something like this so intensity no range around 2 and intensity around 155 and minus 3 on the z position okay so let's start with the intensity let's I'm just going to place it to uh, one with a range uh, 1.9 and 1.5 for all of them and I will do the same for lights too so I said 1.9 and 1.5 and uh, now let's see how we alter the position well we can simply add a vector a new vector free which is zero on the x position zero on the y position but minus zero dot free f on the z position so this what will make it will make it further further away I'm going to use it on all of them and let's see how it how it goes now well it's not going good <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure why let's see the lights okay it's at zero hmm Oh, okay. Because I forgot to add a comma. Okay, let's try again. I wasn't really watching at the screen when I typed it. Okay, now, now we're getting more or less I think it, it's too intense but let's see how it uh, looks with colors now in order to change the colors we do know that the lights have we are going to change all the children of the red light and of the blue light so we are going to access this game object then access its all its children and uh, access its light component and in the light component we are going to change the color so let's do that um, now for lights red that children child count okay that transform child count let's call it int uh, q okay space it a bit yes now lights red transform get child q that transform that get component 
light dot color equals to color no uh how i named it lights no 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 to my color okay i forgot color red okay equals to color red all right so far so good we need to do the same for the blue lights and i think i can use q here as well i will just rename this lights blue color blue no okay and let's copy paste this line somewhere around here as well and now we need if this is working properly we need to do only one more thing regarding this part yes yeah, so we do have a, a red and a bluish color we do need to change uh, all of these children as well so let me let me see again how we have it structured okay now i'd like to go on the deck manager and on my lights here is where i'm activating them my lights no where i am okay so I would have to access all the children that uh, a light has. And then I would need to access the mesh renderer and the material and change the color. And I think we do have a formula for that. So in a light thread, let's make yet another four. Four int k smaller than my lights i dot transform dot child count what would i like to transform my light i dot transform dot get child okay dot get component renderer dot color no and now we do need a bit of investigation this works Material dot color equal to color red. Now, as I'm doing it for the red ones, I'm not sure if it uh, really works, but uh, let, let's just put another color here color, and I'm only going to use it for color blue actually for the first one this uh, color dot blue were pre-made uh, unity colors i will start again yes it does work so i should use my color that i'd like color red which i already declared and then i will copy paste all this It doesn't really matter whether where I'm positioning it uh, if it's in the correct statement. So my light I plus 24 and I want them to be color blue, the one that I have. I will copy this. Actually I copy everything over for loop and here 
here core core blue i minus 24 well i think the script just got a bit more complicated however these are uh, these are notions we can uh, you could try and use them uh, individually on a quad or making a smaller list and i, I will actually try and uh, give an very uh, okay well uh, yes i will try to make a smaller list and uh, you could play play with that until uh, all of this uh, comes to i think i explained it as as best as i could uh, however, yes, I, I can imagine that there are many notions. So maybe before going any further, we should uh, do more uh, more exercises. So with that in mind, I'm going to present a really small exercise regarding, um, let's see if this is working, regarding lists. And I'm going to add it right now, right here. And uh, I think it's uh, it would be good practice. I don't know, imagine uh, like anything that uh, you'd like like a set of books or anything or and uh, using ids and uh, variables or maybe just browse the internet for any any good practice so let's go and uh, make yet let's activate our canvas how much was the text so let's add uh, some lights on this side here so this, uh, for this, I'm going to use a game object here and an empty object. Yes, create empty. So I should name them Wandering Lights. Now, a good thing is that everything that we are doing now uh, is going to help us in all of the other projects. That's why I always say that the basics are the most important because if we will uh, get them right now, later on it's going to be so much easier in order to implement our more complex games. Or we will already, or already have assets created that we can use. And for example, you could make a template of a frame or a border for a sign and uh, use it and reuse it, that's, that's the way it goes in. Uh, in video games okay so now back to our wandering lights i'm not going to create prefabs i'm going to make use of so this would be the main quad and it will have another quad inside it so let's let's make it with an empty so main light as well with a background bg and I'm going to duplicate it and this will be the blinking part blink so let's create in the materials in set 2 and like a blue and yet another blue and more blue so I would like to make use of a random range in this part of a project. So I will uh, duplicate this four times and I will create a script. Wandering lights. Okay. Now, let's set this main light one around here. It doesn't really matter. We could actually instantiate them with, uh, and randomize their position, but uh, it, it's not our purpose here. For at least not at this part. So I do have this one here. And the blinking part of all of them should be scaled down. Okay, and let me check if it happened. Blink, blink, blink. 
Oops. Yes, it did. But I think it. All right, something like this. So blink one should. Two. Okay. So what would I want them to do? To be shut down when we begin. And uh, the background, let's make another color for the background. Color of, ah, no, not this one. Control Z. Color 4. Let's pick the background, actually, color. Yeah, something like this. Let's, let's keep it like this. So, regarding the script, I wanted to make use of uh, the random range that we learned previous. So we will have a list of public list, public game object of game objects. Uh, my list. I'm going to keep it simple. Now I will go inside the editor. I know that I do have four elements over here. Four. And I would like to add them. So main light, main light one, precisely. So now I would like to have a, a random number. So public int random number and a public float counter. So in update, let's make a function, for example, that uh, let's say counter limit, public float counter limit. So the counter should go equals with counter plus time delta time. without the parenthesis and uh, if the counter reached the limit is bigger or equal to the counter limit let's make a 4 for my list i equals 0 i, I smaller than my list dot count Let's deactivate all the uh, all the children. So uh, how was it? How had we had it structured? For children and children one. Okay. My list. I dot transform dot get child one set active no dot trans let's see game object dot act set active false and now we could make a function but I'm going to implement it in update after for now random number equals random range between one and between zero and five I think uh, let me just double check because we have zero one two three no between zero and four 
actually. Zero, 01 precisely. Uh, I, I'm not sure why I needed to visualize that, but yes, it's, it got me confused here. So it's always better to check and visualizing always helps. So now let's do my list. Random number. Random number. And get all this line here. And set it to true. And we would need to reset the counter. Counter equals to zero. So it will go again. And we could actually create a, a random number for the counter limit. Public float random counter limit. Or, no, actually no. We can randomize the counter limit. Random range between uh, three, no, actually one and two. So it will blink uh, one and three. So it will blink like intensively. And here we need to do the same thing again in start. I thought uh, a bit and Maybe we could do some minor adjustments just to improve uh, the code in our decorations manager. And uh, I also spotted an error. Well, it's not actually quite an error, but uh, we will take care of it. You'll see in a moment uh, what am I talking about. And maybe also give a small user interface like a button to set the given number and the button for the functions. And this should be fairly easy and uh, fast to implement. So let's get to it. Regarding the decorations manager, I think here this function looping lights, well, it's a bit overcharged. What we are doing here, we are setting the first color. In, in my case, I selected it to be red, and that's why I given uh, this name. But uh, let's, you could call it color one, and we could change them at runtime even. So here we are so, uh, actually setting the color of the light as we can see, and setting the color of the simulated lights. We are also doing it for the blue light, for the second light, but we are doing it two times. Why uh, one when i is uh, smaller than 24, and one when i is bigger than 24. So for this, we will need to create uh, a, a function. So I'm going to call it public void update color one. I'm going to actually I it's a thing I really like to do always just to keep them like that. And I'll copy paste it two times. So this would be update color two the first time when i is smaller, and update color two the second time when i is bigger. So inside our first function, we can just take all the code here for the red lights, and I'm going to place it here. For the blue lights, the first function, I'll take all this code and place it here. It will give an error because uh, it does not know who I is, but uh, we will tell it in a second. I will take all of these, control X, and place it in the second function. I will save it. So now here, I would need, only need to update color one. Here, I would need to update color two, the first function. And here, I would need to update color two, the second function. All right, so far, so good. Uh, but we do have an error here. Now, the i is given here. So there is a procedure that we can pass an int or elements from a function to another one. So I will only need this function to uh, let to know that it will receive an int. Int 
I. It does need to have the same name as, uh, as what's written here. We could change it if we'd like, but we, we don't need to change it. Here I would do the same. Tell it that it will receive an int that is called I and that it can use it. So now when I am calling the function, I only need to write I in this case. So now I'm going to control S to save it. Let's minimize everything. So now if somebody would read uh, our code and uh, it is in the loop lights, so he would like to see oh what this function does. So he could go and click on it and uh, see precisely and uh, center only on that function and it's much much easier to to read. So let's see if it's, uh, it should be working just the same and yes it is. And something uh, if you'd like to investigate you could do uh, actually you could add more lights or and you could change the color make maybe a lerp which would switch between uh, two colors at runtime or between uh, three colors and uh, it's called color lerp. I'm not going to go in detail now. Uh, I'm going to talk about the error I have spotted. So in App Manager, when I copy pasted function one in order to create the second function and I modified it properly, we also need to add here, and I'm not sure why we did not get an error, but because u actually comes uh, the last one, so it's a small probability. But if we would uh, be using uh, four or five numbers, for example, then we would have uh, uh, got an error. So we only need to, here at the bottom, different from the first function, we need to repass the u as well, uh, as well add it in the repassing number list. So now this is solved. Let's see if it is working properly. I will give it the biggest pro uh, possible number. Okay. Maybe app manager. Give a number. Let's see if uh, drawing. Oh yes, I, I did modify something in the canvas. Here in the array text, I selected it to be best fit. So it will always give me the biggest possible text that can be be shown inside the uh, inside the square that uh, that is delimited so now back to our app manager start drawing now all the numbers are set automatically and give a number i think the biggest number possible would be 297 no with function 2 with my second function yes okay so it is working properly now I was thinking we could add a button, actually two buttons, one for function one, one for function two, and uh, we would need a third button and an input field to set the, to set the given number. And maybe as a, it would be a good homework for you to add a, another button to set uh, the rows and columns, and they are always the same, so it would be one button. Or you could actually do two buttons, one to set rows, one to set columns, and an input field, uh, or two input fields for both of them. Okay, so I will, I will start uh, creating some buttons I, in Canvas where user interface elements. So button one, it would be a set given set number, not given set number. Now a button comes like this, let me, we can uh, alter it and change its size and shape. I wanted it to be square, ish, and I'm going to position it here. So, whoops, set number. Now a button also has a, has var a variety of elements, colors, uh, an image, and its functions. We will get here in a moment. The others, uh, I, I, will, I won't modify them, I will leave them by default, but please feel free to modify them if you'd like to add your own images or sprites. Go ahead. And uh, the text would be set 
uh, number on that set button. And uh, I will uh, also set it to best fit. And I will copy, double it, control D. And this would be the function one again, and this would be the function two. So I will uh, rename it as well function one and function two and in the text as well function one and a function two so now we only need to, in order to set the number an input field ui and the normal input field I'll drag it. I will use the rec tool. Whoops. Here we go. All right. And I can see that the input field has also a variety of uh, properties. Please go ahead and explore them. Uh, what I am interested in, it's in the content type only integer numbers I want to be able to write inside there the placeholder let's uh, give it a best fit as well and not enter text give a number and the text okay best fit I think this is the text that we are typing all right so now regarding this we will need three functions and it is fairly easy let me just minimize everything so we do know that we when we start drawing the array we only modify this boolean we will need to modify it to set it to true when we do the first function we will need to set this to true it's, it is what we were doing in the inspector so i would i will create a function public void uh, start drawing button and inside it i will set start drawing equals to true and now we only need to tell the button to to modify this parameter here i do the same for function one and function two so public void function one uh, button and copy paste it function two button and i know in function one i need to set my first function i thought i think it's called the boolean equals to true and here my second function equals to true now we will need yet another function for the fourth button which is a uh, set the given number so public void uh, given number button And this function, what needs to do, needs to set the given number, so given number equals to what? Well, to our input field, we do not have a reference to it. So in input, the input field is also a user interface parameter or a component, if you'd like. And uh, so we can use it because we are using this library. So here I, uh, I will add public input field given number underscore if. So now if you would be to add another input field for the house, you could simply copy paste this and uh, rename it properly. And you would need another, another function. And the function would be pretty easy. Rouse equals to columns equals to the oh actually let's see how we get the the value from the input field well, 
we've given number input field I think dot text no let's uh, let's uh, uh, let's investigate so uh, in update I would want to print input field dot no given number if dot text so let's see how uh, how this works all right oh yes because we do not have a, a reference to it so in app manager we do need to draw the input field here now back to app manager and let's uh, rename it properly actually given number if okay so let's see how it goes now I just want to see if yes okay so we do have a, a way to get the value from here it's 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 text but what I'm trying to to do here in our function I'm trying to set an integer so given number to given number if dot text so I'm trying to set an integer to a text and uh, well I think it says us precisely that cannot implicitly convert type string to int so the way to do that it's an int dot parse and this one in parentheses now it should work so let's uh, correlate our buttons and this is the easy part I will select set number button now in order here we do have an on click button and its property on click runtime function none we would only need to add our app manager here and we'll need to search for the fun function so the function is also in app manager function one button function two button give number button that is the function that I wanted to correlate with because I want uh, the given number to uh, to be set when I press it and we will need to do the same for the function one button and the function two button you see I clicked them both because they both use the same um, game object which is the app manager so on click I will add the app manager here and function one only function one selected should do the function one button and function two should do a manager or function two button and I think we are set to go let's see they are working properly oh and we I wanted to do another button to draw VRI but you 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 can create that it's the same or actually I will create it rapid uh, quickly so public void uh, draw RI button Oh no, I did created it. I did not create the button. Set number, set number, for example. I'll double it. W. And modify it accordingly. And now, as I double it, it has the same function as uh, the other one. But no, I do want to use this function, start drawing button. And I think now, now it should work. And let's select our app manager and see if uh, everything is 
So start drawing. Okay, start the drawing. Let's actually try and modify our array text a bit higher so it doesn't interfere. All right, I'm going Control S, save it, draw, and give a number uh, 33, set number. And let's see in App Manager if it took the number. Yes, it did. And function one, function two. Okay, uh, we could also add uh, different uh, components and maybe making it scroll. But uh, we will study this uh, uh, in mo in detail in a uh, in a project to to come. So. Well, I think that now we kind of polished our first application, our practice. And uh, yes, I do, I do believe that uh, we are ready to move further on uh, towards movement. All right then, see you in the next videos. Goodbye. So in this video, I, it's really a quick short video about how you could import uh, a project in Unity. So I will actually export the Practice Essentials project and you can see if I'm uh, hovering over it, you can see it has 212 megabytes. This is because all the stuff are actually internal Unity stuff. What we are interested in is this asset folder, assets folder, where you can see that I have a resources folder and everything that we, we created in the Practice Essentials. So I'm going to take this, uh, this assets folder, I'm going to copy it and on my desktop I'm going to create a new folder and call it actually practice essentials one for example. I'm going to paste the assets folder, I'm going to zip it and I will upload it on drive. Now. Uh, if you'd like to open it, you'd have, of course, to unzip it, get this folder here. And uh, in Unity Hub, you'd have to just to select open, add project from disk, go to the location where you saved it and just select practice essentials, add project. Now it will not, because it does not have all that internal Unity stuff, it will not know the version. So you would have to select the same version actually that we are using because otherwise it could uh, give errors. So change version and uh, it uh, it should open. Okay, now I will double click it. Oh, it's already open. Yes. Oh, and it gives me it it gives me a an warning and it tells me that. Because it doesn't recognize the version, it will tell me that it was saved with a different version of Unity. But no, we will, in this case, we'll just press continue. And uh, now Unity will do all its importing. And it's going to take maybe a minute or two. But uh, yes, uh, this is the way. And you should, uh, you should have no, no problem in implementing this. All right, then. Uh, see you in the next videos. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the second part of our course. Uh, in this chapter, we are going to treat about movement and rotations. We are going to start on how to change the position of an, ob of an object, then the rotations, and then both. And uh, we are going to create a simple Pong game. And well, this chapter is a stage that is going to bring us closer to the rigid body part, where we are, we are going to make a more complex game. So. Uh, let's get to it. Uh, I have created a, a simple 2D core project. I press create project. In this case, I'm going to press cancel, minimize this, and I have a blank project. Before everything, I'm going to change inside environment, the ambient color to a bright white, full white, and back in inspector, I'm going to create the resources folder and I'm going to move the scenes, drag it inside, sample scene, I'm going to save it, 
rename it uh, test scene and reload it let me see if the light yes it kept the same ambient all right and now in resources i'm also going to need a folder called scripts and i'm going to create a script called test and i'm going to open it i will also need a folder called materials and to create a quad let's see materials i'm going to create like four of them Selecting them all, setting the metallic to zero, the smoothness to zero. And let's make them um, so maybe brighter somehow. I don't like it. Oh, okay, something like this. I will need a red. Oh, violet will do. Blue and a green okay that's it let's create a quad and this would be our player and i'm going to assign the script i'm going to minimize all this because i'm not going to be working with those right now whoops test yes i do have it so now how do we move an object well with it selection selected in uh, inspector I, or I already have a transform property so we need to alter these things and so by default i'm going to comment this the y-axis is the up axis the x-axis is the right axis if we want to move it to to the left we can multiply the right with minus one so it would move to the left but you're going to see in a bit what I'm talking about. And uh, I change it to 3D. The blue axis, the Z axis, it's always the forward axis. I'm going, I'm commenting you all this so just that further on is no confusion. I'm going to save it. I'm going to actually zero it on everything, on the Z uh, axis as well. And let's see how, uh, what we can use to store the info of the position of our object. I'm going to create three floats. So move Y and move Z. I'm also going to create a vector free, which is my favorite to use. And also a vector two, which is not my favorite to use. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Okay, so now in update, if I would like to move my, or to equalize the position uh, of my object with these floats, I would have to say transform that position, because it is my position, I have a script assigned it to, to me myself, the player object, transform position equals to new vector free, and inside move X, move Y and move Z. I'm going to save it and let's run it. I'm going to select the player. So now we see, no we don't see, yes now we see that precisely I got the same controls that I have up there and also on the Z axis. We can see it here in the 3D resemblance. Okay, I'm going to pause it and I'm going to use to comment this and I'm going to use transform that position equals to my position. And we're going to see that if I alter my position we get the same result. Okay, I'm going to stop it and I'm going to use the vector 2. So transform that position equals to my pose. 
and now I saved it Control S let's press play precisely the same result now why do I not like so much to use the vector 2 let's say that for some reason I had a break background here I'm going to create another quad BG from background I'm going to zero it and I'm going to give it a color yellow but a nicer yellow no actually this yellow works and the player let's make him reddish okay so now everything is uh, is all right but uh, no let's say that uh, for some reason I have a background or the player somewhere no not the player the player should be at zero or let's say no at minus minus three and the background should be at minus one because why because that's how no or minus zero dot two okay and the player at mi minus zero dot thirty two why because that's how I have my scene arranged also I always encourage to use the zero value always and then to go like if you need something to be closer to the camera in order to stand out where is the camera okay so here is the camera and at minus 10 and here are, is my stuff which I have so it, it's uh, similar with layers but if I do need something and now if I would press play my player would get its position from the vector 2 which keeps the zero always at zero the, the z value always at zero and bam it disappears and uh, well this is an important um, detail to keep in mind not only for the player or but for enemies and for everything that's why I prefer to use a vector free and give you all the position properly even if the z is zero now moving on let's see I'm going to comment all this and I'm going to zero it on unity because now I think it's working properly yes actually no just just in case I'm going to set the background to one so it's further away or to five six okay that, that should do and now we can see clear in the 2d aspect let's see how we move our our player our cube via script oh by the way one thing in 3d uh, many people do their games well uh, or their player movement along the forward axis which is the z one the blue one in 2d I prefer to have my main uh, axis the x axis the horizontal axis uh, but you could choose depending on the game which axis it is your main However, if I'm not sure what the game is going to be about, or in this case, I know that eventually you are going to try to make a pawn game, I do want uh, the X axis to be like the right axis to be my main axis. So actually I'm going to create, as you can see, if I press W and in local as well, the X axis. So this is going to be my front now even if it is the right axis so I'm going to create a smaller quad indicator I'm going to move it scale it down and make it blue okay so now I know that this is my front why it is important it's not really important at the moment but uh, later on will be okay so let's see how we transform our position so I do have transform that position equals to what well my position where I'm at plus what well plus a new vector free vector free the same one here move X but we are only going to move it on the x-axis for the moment okay so let's see how that works 
I'm going to press play. And well, nothing happens because I'm adding a new vector free with all its values set to zero. So to move it on the x axis, I'm going to write one here. And we can see like it moves really fast. What that does, each frame, it moves one unit on the x axis. So it teleports one unit each frame. And uh, as it is rendered, I think 30 or 60 up to 60 frames per second, it is mov moving very fast. So let's uh, write something smaller, 0 0.1. Well, this is more acceptable. However, it still teleports hating. So in order to move, to move it like this, uh, I'm going to erase all that and make a new vector free. I'm going to have another public float called speed and here I need to give its x position so I'm going to add the speed on the x-axis multiplied with time dot delta time on the y-axis I want to keep its uh, its actual position plus zero I don't want to add anything and I don't want to add nothing on the z-axis neither I'm going to save it and I'm going to run it and I should have modified the speed I'm going to set the speed to 1 okay well now we do see that actually it's moving one unit not per frame but per second because the speed is set at 1 if the speed would be at 2 it would move 2 units I'm going to leave uh, let it at 1 by default all right um, now let's see what uh, the transform local uh, position does. I'm going to duplicate our player. Whoops, I'm going to move it. And I'm going to change its color and its name. Player 2. Okay, now I'm going to create another quad. And I'm going to call it empty. No, 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 parent. I'm going to zero it. But I'm going to change its rotation a bit. So 34 uh, degrees on this z-axis. Now we can see that it, its x-axis is this one here. Now I'm going to make player 2 children of a parent. And player 2 and player 1 have the same script so when I'm modifying it now I'm modifying it for both of them so uh, okay now actually let's test this how does this work it works the same now let's see if I change the rotation of player 2 E nothing happens Let's change the rotation of player 1. Nothing happens. They continue to move to the right. Now let's use another formula. Which is this one. Turn that local position equals local position plus, well, the same thing. We are going to test with the same thing. Now you need to be careful not to misspell this because if you will equalize transform local position with a transform position it's not uh, it wouldn't we would not get a correct result or at least not all the times so let's see how this works right now so it should be moving on the local x axis and precisely we can see that uh, as player 1 has no parent its local x axis is the same of, as the global one. However, the one that, that it is parented, player 2, it is moving along that axis, indifferent of its own rotation. Okay, let's see yet another way how to do, how to transform our position. Let's say transform that position 
equals transform dot position plus vector free dot right and I'm going to save it and run it and let's see what happens whoops oh, oh, oh yes <laughs> that was bad I forgot to add uh, multiplied by speed by time dot delta it was happening same as the first time moving it one uh, one unit each frame now we should have a similar result as as in here and precisely it is moving towards the right thing indifferent of uh, their rotation of or of uh, of their parent rotation now i'm going to copy paste this and i'm going to comment this one and instead of vector free dot right i'm going to use transform dot right and here is the interesting thing this is something i like i like to use now transform right keeps in mind the player's rotation not the parent's rotation but my own local rotation and it is very useful in uh, in many games now all of these uh, methods are, are useful but depends of a game or in which aspect you are we are going to use it so what we are going to use for our pawn game is this way yet another formula transform dot translate and wait translate and we need a vector free to translate it so I said I only want to move it on the x-axis uh, well I don't want to move it on the y nor the z okay uh, so it should be if I'm not wrong speed dot time dot delta time and I don't want to move it on the y nor the z so I'm only only adding a value on the x axis but which is good about translate is that it is its local x axis and we should get uh, a similar result to this one which by the way this would work similar with local position and we are going to test it in a moment let's see how this works so we are using the transform translate precise I'm going to comment this and copy this one and I'm just going to use local position instead and let's see how how that works ah, no with local position it keeps in mind of a parent and also I think its own rotation yes and also its own, rot own rotation so it is added to that while player one which is unparented works similar as, as previously uh, well this is it about movement at least uh, for now this would be the very essentials of movement in the next video we are going to add rotations and in the other video we are going to add some input all right then uh, see you in a bit goodbye hello so continuing from uh, our previous project this time we are going to set on rotations so let's uh, let's go ahead and do that i will need to add three more floats public float rot x rot y rot z now rotations work with quaternions what are quaternions well 
Unity actually works with quaternions. They are complex variables, but actually makes rotation easier for internal transactions, to put it so, uh, for, to optimize its, uh, its functioning. However, quaternions are not very humane to, to be understood and to work with, but luckily we do have a method of translation, to put it so. If you'd like to read more about quaternions, please go ahead. I think it is a, a large field in which uh, and requires advanced mathematics and it would take uh, a lot of time to investigate them here and now. And that, uh, that is not the purpose at the moment. So, yes, as I always said, I encourage you to go to go investigate as much as possible about uh, everything and anything and always testing, just like we are doing now, but with your own uh, variables and uh, whatever you, you would like to, to learn or to test. Okay, so uh, back to, to rotations. So, as I said, they do use quaternions, but we do have uh, ways of uh, translating them. So, the scene is just the same with one uh, of them parented, the green one. Actually, I'm going to move it a bit as well. Yeah, and so let's see how we do we rotate it. Well, it's pretty easy transform rotation equals to quaternion dot e -wheeler and rot x rot y rot z and let's see how that goes now we can see they both have a rotation and precisely the green one came back to zero. Now his local rotation, anyway, here I do have uh, the rect, transform rect, it is the local rotation right here. It is to minus 73, but his global rotation, it is set to zero. That's why what transform rotation does. It keeps in mind the global axis. And uh, well, if I would be to rotate it on X, but it's I doubt we're going to use that too much, or on Y, at least not in these games. What we are interested in is in its Z rotation. And the same for player 1. Oh yeah, and uh, as this one it is set at 0, and, the, and its local rotation at minus 73, and then the parent should be at 73, precisely. Now, with local rotation, it's similar with uh, local position. Transform dot local rotation. And I'm going to comment this one. It will add on top of, uh, of a parent, parent rotation. So it, when I press play, it will happen nothing to neither of them. Oh, actually it did. Oh, yes, yes, because it sets its local rotation set to zero. Now he had a rotation as well. No, I, I'm setting it to zero from now. And I'm going to press play. So now it should nothing be happening to neither of them. And if I'm rotating it five degrees or 50 degrees, well, they put on top of the other one because it already had a rotation from the parent. So now this guy's global rotation should be at 73 plus 54, 122. And we can do and try that, actually, uh, let's do that. Let's set its rotation, not its local rotation, but its rotation at 122 on the set axis. something like that. I'm not sure if I calculated precisely, but I remember that it was orientated uh, so with 50 degrees more, some, something like that it was. Let's see how that goes. Yeah, precisely. Okay, I'm going to control Z, control Z. Now, another way to to get rotation, it's with a nice vector free. So Euler angles equals new 
on vector three. And I'm going to copy paste this one here. And we should do just the same thing as rotation does, but it is nice that we have uh, access to a direct vector free here. And we can also print them. Yeah, actually, let's print. Print transform dot Euler angles. And this is helpful when making tests and everything. So they're at zero. Now the green ones at 50. And so on. Now I'm going to comment all of them. And we do have another formula. Transform local. Euler angles. And we should do the same thing as local rotation. Precisely. And now this one here should add on top. Precisely. And now let's try a rotation in time and using a speed. So I'm going to add a speed. Rot transform okay, so equals so transform rotation equals to transform no, 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 no. Actually, we're going to use the transform Euler angles because we want to be able to add a vector free Euler angles equals transform dot Euler angles plus new vector free and we said we only wanted to rotate it on the Z axis so here we'd have to put speed rot multiplied with time dot delta time and save it because if you would do it the other way transform dot rotation equals to transform actually let's let's uh, test it both way, both ways plus quaternion dot Euler and I'm going to try the and precisely the same thing oops Okay, so you can see we can't add it. Let's try multiply it. Nope. Yeah, okay, let's see how, how it goes. But the way to go and this is a, a stable way to go, viewer angle. So let's try this one first. So speed rod. Let's set it to 35. Okay. So now if I am not wrong, it should be moving 35 degrees per second. 360. So it should do a whole loop in a second. And same for, for player one. Precisely. Now let's see. I will comment this one, Control S, and let's see if this has the same effect. Speed rot, 360. Yes, in this case it does. And they should work the same or similar regarding local rotation and local Euler angles. In this case, it will add to the rotation. Loop. 
local Euler angles. And I'm going to copy this as well. Just changing the local rotation. Let's put a bit of space between them. Control K, Control D, Control S. Today I'm going to comment the last one. First, we are going to try with the local Euler angles. Wait, wait, wait. I want to see where it started from. So I'm going to go increase it very slowly. Yes, so it starts from where from where it was. But I think in, uh, in the other case, Yes, as well. Well, so there you go. There are many ways to write and uh, to achieve the same thing. Maybe you are going to see them in scripts or maybe we are also going to browse through other scripts when we are going to do our project, uh, the next project, the 2D platformer, which I'm thinking about. Uh, so there will be many, maybe many ways to write something but uh, it helps to get this right and play with it so you you don't get confused there are many ways to achieve the same thing all right then let's go towards uh, our next video and uh, add some more inputs and movement okay then see you in a bit goodbye hello so continuing from the previous video after we learned rotations and uh, position transforms let's try and apply them with uh, with our inputs both with keys and uh, and with the mouse as well so for that i'm going to delete these two this one as well i can keep the background i don't mind and i'm going to create another 3d object a quad and i'm going to do nothing to it no actually i'm going to create a script as well um, input inputs test I'm going to open the script so okay well in unity there is a variety of ways to to get an input we can get the input of a key or they are also called buttons what is the difference we do have in edit in preference no project settings input manager and here we do have some axes and this is the way you need uh, we need to write it in order to to get it and we can see a negative button is left which would be the left arrow or a alternative negative button so this would go to the left and d to the right it also has it should have a value okay but we are going to get the value if it's positive when i press d the input manager would give a plus one on the horizontal axis if i press an a would give a would give a minus one and we do ha also have a jump button which is correlated to space so okay let's uh, let's get to it i'm going to so this would be let's rename it player and add the inputs test script on it so for now i'm just going to to write different stuff in uh, update different formulas and let's see how they behave so if input dot get key key code dot a Pr 
print one. I'm just doing a, a variety of tests just to see how how they behave. Okay, I'm going to save it. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, parenthesis. So when I press get key, nothing happens. Oh wait, I need to click on the game. So while I'm keeping it pressed, we can see here that I'm pressing the A button. Now, if input key, get key down. I'm going to save it and let's run it. I think it is set to clear on play, yes. I'm clicking on the game tab and now I'm pressing A. So only when it, it only happened once when, when I pressed it. And I have to press it again and again and again for this counter to, to grow. And now I'm going to try get key up. I'm clicking in the game, I'm pressing A, nothing happens. I released it and there you go, something happened. So this actually helps me to, well, to achieve different things. If for example, I, I would be shooting and I'm shooting like uh, from a shotgun and uh, I don't want it to continue shooting, to have a fixed fire rate whenever I'm pressing a button. So I would use maybe get key down or maybe I am flying and doing something and when they get that key up, it should uh, not allow me to fly anymore or uh, an infinity of uses. Now let's try another one. Actually, no, I'm going to comment this one. Okay. Let's try button down. If input get button and jump, I think it was called. And it is correlated to the space button. Print I am pressing space and precisely when I press space it's getting it. It is the same with get button down or get button up. I'm going to comment this and if input dot get mouse button zero would be the left one and one would be the right one print I am clicking the left MB precisely and it works uh, as expected the same for mouse button one. Now, uh, what I was telling you about movement, uh, let's see if input dot get axis get axis horizontal or no, actually let's try print directly print get axis horizontal actually no I don't need this and let's see so now I'm not pressing anything it is set to zero I'm pressing a it is set to minus one 
I am pressing D, it is set to 1. Okay. This, I'm going to copy this. Vertical. I'm not pressing anything, I'm pressing W, it is 1, I'm pressing S, it is minus 1. I'm pressing the up arrow and a down arrow. And now I'm pressing both W and S. So yeah, it, it doesn't really know where to go. Okay, so knowing this, we could actually do Let's uh, create a, a speed for our player. Public float speed and speed rot. We're going to use it later on. Oh yes, we actually I wanted to print something else. Print input dot get axis. Mouse x so now i'm not uh, touching the mouse i'm moving it to the left and now i'm moving it to the right so you can see that when i'm moving it to the right it's a positive value i'm moving it back to the left it should be a negative value And I think it is repeating itself. Yes, precisely. Just because it gets the same value, that's why it's not specified in here. So we do know that when I'm moving it to the left, I do have a negative value and to the right a positive value. It's the same as with the inputs. And it would go the same for the mouse Y. Okay, so knowing that, let's first try and uh, transform our position. So transform.position equals with new, no, with, with transform.position plus new vector free. So on the x axis, I would have input get axis horizontal on the y the vertical and zero on the z z axis and all of this should actually boom be multiplied with a speed and with time dot delta time so I'm going to separate it on two lines. Control K, Control D, Control S. I'm going to add a speed of five. And I'm going to set its default Z to zero, everything set to zero. And I can move it from W, A, S, D and it goes out of frame, everything goes. Now, let me see, okay. Let's uh, put a small indicator here. Oops. I'm going to make the Y axis my main axis. Now, actually, the X again even if I'm going to move not the Y because I'm starting in by by pressing W and I don't have a level here. Okay, so we're going like this. And this is the its front to put it, so the up at axis. Materials. Okay. 
it, it doesn't mean no it doesn't matter if it's aligned or not now another way i would like to oops control k control c another way to to move it and i prefer that way it's transform dot translate and directly this vector here multiplied with speed multiplied with speed okay, this would so let's see what this does It should have the same. Oh, 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 too much of a speed. <laughs> With speed and time, delta time. Okay, so. It acts precisely the same as before. Now, something else I would like to do. I would like to modify its set rotation. So I'm going to add another float. Actually, no, I'm not going to add another float. I will only modify its vertical velocity. So this should sit still. And now I'm going to actually transform that local rotation equals to quaternion dot Euler zero zero and speed rot multiplied with input get axis no input dot get axis mouse x quotes and multiplied with time dot delta time so now I should be able to steer with the mouse. Okay, let's see how this goes. Oh yes, it, it doesn't work because I have not assigned a speed rotation. Let's say one, no, 500. Hmm. Oh yes, precisely. Equals transform local rotation. Actually, this would be easier done like this. Done like this plus equals. No, for multiplied with. Let uh, let's test it. Okay, yeah, it works, but not really. So, I will go ahead and say, if input dot get mouse button zero. So if I'm pressing the left mouse button, I should do this. And here, I would have to add a minus. So with the reverse of the speed, because it was moving precisely at the reverse. And here, just to simplify, actually, so it looks more readable, transform that local, so there is no confusion, multiplied 
so this is a formula you don't really need to learn it just take it as it is we could have done with uh, local Euler angles and actually that's what we are going to do next okay so now I'm clicking I'm not clicking the mouse button I'm going to click it and I can rotate I'm going to press W and I can rotate okay let's go back yes so this is working at some level now let's see how would we translate that to local Euler angles local Euler angles plus and here it would be a new vector free and they should work exactly the same well, let's test it yeah I'm pressing the left mouse button W okay so far so good now let's see which are our limits so I'm here so let's say I wanna here would be one limit 446 so the bottom limit would be minus this 454 and minus yes no, actually the bottom one hmm so what I would like for it to do when he gets to this limit he should spawn around here somewhere so let's say which one we said and minus 5 so a simple way of doing that if transform that position yes I can I can use the global position because that's that that's the one I I took it that why is it bigger than 440 well let me see bigger or equal then then set me back over there now it's smaller then set me back transform that position equals to new vector free transform that position dot x minus five no five yeah no minus five in this, in this case and transform that position dot z and here it should be precisely the reverse but with a positive 5 so let's see how that goes on the y axis hmm. no wait let's start at zero so i'm starting here okay one condition is not set well enough smaller than minus precisely Oh yes, I know where. So we are setting a uh, wrong uh, wrong value. We should actually set the same value. So I'm going to press five and five. 
to both of them so if it's set to let's let's see how this works if not we are going to give it a a small percentage of of adjustment a small value okay so this should work but yes th this works so they do need to have the same value let's uh, let's do the same on uh, on the x-axis but with other values let's see so this should be the one like okay let's rotate it somewhere around here minus 850 one um, eight dot five okay zeroing it on both rotations and positions so eight five f it should be minus that y and and let's see how this goes over for our pong game we are going i'm uh, i'm pressing the left mouse button yes for our pong game, we are going to use a different, uh, a different script regarding rotations, at least, because it would need to bounce, not to pass from a place to another. Yes, yeah, so, so this would be a very basic uh, overview of the inputs. Well, let's get uh, started on our pong game. All right, then. See you in a bit. Goodbye. Hello. So, continuing our project from uh, where we left it um, glad to tell you that we are ready to start our pong game and uh, that we kind of finished all the input basics I know the basics usually are are a bit dull but no worries we are going to create a new scene put shiny materials and whatnot uh, we are not gonna create a frame but you could import the frame that we created it uh, in the earlier project like maybe export in assets export package and you'd have to only select the prefabs that we created and then uh, or the whole scene or just the prefabs and then mount them together or use any kind of frame something you created in a 2d program or found on the web uh, anyway back to what i wanted to show you about the inputs was one more thing which slipped my mind before so print input dot get axis and the axis name is mouse scroll whoops with one s only scroll wheel and this is useful for example when uh, you're creating a zoom in zoom out using it for for the camera and then you can apply the same concepts to to touches input touches so now i'm clicking let's see console so it is set at zero i'm scrolling back towards me so we can see that it's set to minus and forward it has a positive value not negative okay well Having said that, I'm going to comment this as well. And back in our project, in resources, I'm going to create a new scene. Scene, uh, Pong. Open it, 
So what we're going to use, I'm going to use new materials. I renamed this to set one and I'm going to create another folder set two with four different colors. So the first one is going to be my sphere. Let's create the sphere actually and see how it blends. A quad here I can see that I forgot to change the ambient lighting so I'm going to do that right away okay and I'm going to add a material to my sphere color one and also an opacity map which we do have here a circle yes back to sphere and i'm just going to drag it inside albedo and set it to cut out so now what color should it have thinking reddish something yeah something like this i'm not sure if i want to keep the same background so i'm in camera Yes, and let's make the sphere back to sphere. Let's give it uh, some emission. Color. Something like, yes, something like that. And let's add to it one more thing. Add component, it's a trail renderer, which I'm glad I found this component because before I was using a uh, other component line render and it's uh, it's a bit more complicated but it gives actually a bit uh, of a different result thing is uh, we need to uh, let it set to emit if we want to use an emitting material so I'm just going to drag here drag here in materials uh, color too because for now if I would be to you can see it's a it's a really thick shape of a trail and uh, and it has no color because the line render does not recognize that material which it carries so i'm going to start with a width i'm going to set it to 0 0.1 let's see how yeah now it's better and i'm not going to modify this color but I will assign the material that I want to use and this material I am going to modify. I will set the emission onto it and let's make what kind of emission? Something like this. Ooh, too much of me. emission. Let's modify the albedo to a darker color and I can watch it here it's too pinkish now it's too red out oh, okay well I, I will keep it like this whatever the result but you can uh, feel free and, and modify it so I'm zeroing in and I'm going to create an empty and this would be my game manager I will also create a script pong manager open it and I will assign it to the game manager so uh, how I planned to do this the game starts now the sphere will start moving to the right or to the left but uh, it's going to use that kind of movement it, it will only move on the x-axis now it hits here at some angle it will never go straight or maybe sometimes it will go straight 
uh, but I will give a player opportunities to, to give it a bit of curvature. However, the sphere will never be able to go straightly up like this because it will get forever to get to the other player. So we want to limit the angles and we want to, lim uh, to make a random function in which direction it will shoot the first time when, when it starts. So we are not going to use instantiate. Uh, w let's say the sphere got here, so I'm thinking player 1 should be in the left side. So when uh, it passed player 1, when player 1 lost a point, then the sphere should be set uh, again to 0, 0 and repeat the, I called it an ignition function, which lets us decide where, where the sphere should go left, right, and at what angle. So, let's get to it. I'm zeroing it again. And Pong Manager. So, I will need so, variables variables needed public game object mice no sphere it doesn't matter i'll know which sphere public float speed and public float z rotation okay now in update i want the sphere to move so i said i'm going to use translate not if I would be to use transform dot translate, it would move me myself the game manager. No, I want to move the sphere, so I would go sphere dot transform dot translate, and I do need a vector free. So speed it will be will have no acceleration and, uh, and simply speed multiplied with time dot delta time. This is on the x-axis, zero movement on the y or the z. And sphere that transform that local rotation equals to z rot no to quaternion. Naturally, let's do it with. Uh, local Euler, angle, Euler angles new vector free and I will have zero zero or no 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 actually I don't yeah zero zero I can leave them at zero and Oh, and see, rot. Okay, so having this will allow me to calculate in a function in start the set rotation. So let's uh, let's see for now. Print I'm going to actually comment this to first uh, these two last lines and see how the spheres uh, if it's working properly regarding the movement. It should work. I have tested it before, but just in case. So I will set the speed to five and press play. Now it should move to the right. Yes. Now I would like to be able to rotate it, so I will uncomment this, and I do have an error over there. Okay, so I can uh, rotate it from here, similar to a snake. By the way, for, uh, using this, we could actually multiply the sphere again and again and again, and create a game like. Uh, a snake-like game. Uh, however, the snakes are 
games are usually working with grid with grids and uh, that's uh, that's a bit more complicated but the way we do it it would be to tell each of our spheres before our actual posi position each frame and therefore each sphere would be an instance of the same one but with different names and would carry an array so that would be a way to go but this this would be more advanced and more complicated for loops uh, back to our pawn game so I can control the rotation of a sphere now I just want to read something I'll comment everything sphere transform dot local Euler angles so I know I would like to know how and uh, how I will uh, instantiate the sphere so I'd like to have it something between this value so it would be a value of 45 precisely like in here and minus 45 which minus 45 which will work in our case it's shown as 315 uh, it's good I'm showing you this because uh, if you try to implement uh, this and use these values instead of this uh, it, uh, it uh, you might get some errors you, you need to be aware of that that's why so here it's set at minus 135 while here it was set at 360 minus 135 so yes 225 roughly and here minus 215 okay so what did i understood nothing <laughs> let's let's try again i will zero it so i know that i can rotate from 45 it's correct and minus 45 and on the other side I'm reading this 135 plus 90 225 it should be okay so I'll create a method public void function ignition now I'll show you just uh, in order to not charge uh, the inspector I will only use an an int int temp int so it's a temporal int equals random range between between one to three so it can be either either one or two and I'm sorry okay equals that now if temp int equals one oh my goodness there you go you should do this if temp int is precisely 2 you should do this so sphere no, actually z rot equals so when it equals 1 I would like for 0 to be random range between minus 45 and 46 because I want to include the 45 as well if not the rot equals random range between W okay 135 and 225 
six because I want 225 included and in start I'm going to use ignition so now my sphere should start moving with an angle I need to minimize this yes precisely let's do it again okay Yes, it, it seems we, we do have a pretty normal behavior. Now let's see our limits. So, actually now I'll limit it here, right here where, where is this square. So I know if I'm going to bring a frame, it will be easier for me. So here it will be a margin, a frame. Which position are we are? 348, okay, three, let's see. Yeah, this should work and the other position would be minus so we would have public float upper limit and horizontal or left limit we only need uh, two of them we are going to use the opposite for the others So the upper limit we said it was 3.5 and the left limit or side limit. Should be right before this one here. Minus 7.5. Will it take it? Uh, it kind of bites a bit. But I'm, I'm going to leave it like this. Okay. And I should be using uh, negative uh, values for both of them. So it's not. Uh, so, okay, left limit, it's minus. And this I'm going to call it bottom limit. Oops. Control S. All right, so now let's try and uh, see what we can do with the sphere. So if we will have four smaller, no, sphere transform. that position that x we are starting with the left minute uh, limit smaller than or equal to the left limit then do this now if sphere that transform that position that x bigger than or equal to minus the left limit so it's the same as writing minus one multiplied minus one multiplied with the left limit so it changes it it will make it positive and if sphere that transform that position that y smaller than the upper bottom limit do this and if sphere that transform that position dot y bigger and or equal to minus one multiplied with a bottom limit it should do the following Ctrl K, Ctrl D, just in case something wasn't ordered. So, from my testing, I saw that on the left limit, actually Z 
rot equals to 180 minus z rot. Uh, how do I know this? I tried to imagine different planes and uh, I tested it and that's how I found it. And I think this should work here as well. And regarding the vertical limit, z rot should equal minus z rot in both of them. And let's see how that's working. Okay. <laughs> it is not working. Well, uh, let's uh, let's try again. And let's try and push it a bit. It just that it sticks over there. So I will say sphere transform that position equals to new vector free. So now it is at the it is at the left limit, it is at, le uh, at the most left side. So I would like to add, a, after I change its rotation, I would like to also alter its position. Transform that position dot x plus 0 dot 1 or 0 1 f. It's, it should, uh, so sphere. and it should keep its position on over y and dot the z that y i'm going to skip a row we could have uh we could have put a zero here but uh, let's just keep it uh, like this so we get more accustomed with the vector free values so I'm going to save it and I'm going to copy it and here it's at the right limit so I will need to actually get off 0 0.01f and let's see how this works on, uh, on the x-axis at, at least. And still doesn't. Hmm. Let me see if it's working like this. Minus a hundred eighty. No. Okay then. I will uh, I'll take a short break, start investigating and and be right back with it. Hello. Uh back to our project, continuing from where we left it. Actually, I'm going to delete everything uh that I that I added. Yeah, this wasn't here. This wasn't here. Whoops. Nor this. So, I think what we had here, it was sort of like uh, like this, like zero zero one minus zero that zero one, and it was position sphere that transform that uh, I will write write local position. I will change it to how it was in a in a moment. 001 F okay so now I'll press ctrl F I will try and find uh, share transform no local position 
I've done quite some investigating. Local position. Okay, and let's change it to position only. Okay. And I'm going to delete this. So I think uh, this is what uh, this is how I left the the script before starting to to investigate. So at the beginning, I thought it's a, it's an error from my device because uh, if you, if the speed is too fast, I would need maybe a larger adjustment. So I added a public float adjustment. So instead of that, I'm going to use adjustment. So here I'm adding the adjustment. And as you can see, I'm uh, using global position. It should not matter at this point. And I'm going to do similarly for the Y axis. It doesn't matter if uh, the rotations comes before or after. So here I will just take off the adjustment from the Y because this would be it's smaller than the bottom and this is for the top. No, here I would add the adjustment and on the top I'll take it off. I'll copy this. Okay, so let's see how this goes. I'll set I'll set the adjustment to zero. Now increase the speed. And it is working. Why? Because I also did a very important thing. Here it was actually this were at the reverse and this was set to Euler angles. It was set like this, uh, local Euler angles equals to new vector three. Okay, so in, in any case it, uh, it should work the same. So what I was doing was doing first the moving and after the rotation, which it was wrong. We need to do first the rotation and then the moving. So now, now you can see I'm getting the same error as before. And in this case, not here in the statement, but here, yes, it is important to do the rotation first. So then the translation can have place in the correct direction. Well, it is a, it is a, a matter of investigation. Oh, and I added also a detecting distance and the rotation factor for something we are going to to add uh, next. So let me just show you adjustment variables. This one here, detecting distance, detecting distance and the rotation factor. Uh, now, as you can see, well, uh, the script it's similarly to how it was. I will create a void movement and copy paste all these. inside. So now this is my movement void and the ignition. I have nothing else. I will also add the, the script on the drive. So I will save it. So now in update movement. Okay, so far so good. So now we would need to add the players. Let me check just again. Yes, so we don't get errors. And I'm going to set the adjustment actually to zero 01. 
Well, maybe this is too small for a bad bigger speed. Zero two. Zero that one. Okay, this should work well. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm. <laughs> Uh, the speed it should be. I'm going to leave it like this. Just the advancement set to 0 0.1. Uh, so let's create our player. Game object quad. Player one. And I will zero it. Oops. Zero zero. And minus six point five. Now, it would be nice if we if we could use collision, we could say if the sphere collides with this, then go the opposite way. But we did not learn collisions. We are going to learn them precisely the next lesson. So I think it's, uh, it is a challenge to do it like this. So what I thought about it, let's add a color to, to our player. So I created a green. And I added it. It's kind of too green. Or maybe this is no which wait a moment. Oh yes, that's the camera. Background maybe slightly lighter. Alright. So back to our player. As I was thinking we do have a function, so I'm not going to move it for a moment. And uh, the function is print vector free distance. And we need to give it two points between uh, the distance sphere dot transform dot position and player one. I also have created a public game object player one player two but I haven't added them player one dot transform dot position so let's see the distance I'm going to click on the sphere oh I need to assign the, the player of course so I'll just drag it So yes, 6.5. Let's see now getting closer. So here in the middle, 0 0.8. On the upper part, 1.6. And 1.6 as well on the downer part. So as we can see, it takes actually the distance from the center to the distance of the sphere. And we are not interested in that. For that purpose, what, uh, what I thought about was to create some small tiny things, children of a player one, some quads, and the sphere will be able to detect them. So let's do just that. And actually this one, the first one, I'm going to call it minus six. And, and you'll see in a moment why. I'm going to make it very, very small. Something like this. And I'm going to position it somewhere around here. And control D, control D, control D, four, five, six. And another six on this side. One, two, four five and six so in this dense which we are going to turn off this is where actually our pong pale to put it so will uh, will be able to 
to recognize if there was a collision or not. And why these values? Well, I was thinking if it's hitting on the upper part, it should have a bigger value, in this case minus 6, to give it a proper rotation towards the upper part, maybe. And in the lower part, well, a bigger rotation towards the bottom. A sort of an effect. So I'm going to rename them as minus 5. And just so I don't create another script in order to hold this property, I'm going to use it directly from from their names. Name minus 1. Now I'm going to start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Alright, so now I'm going to say here, I want to print something else. So for i smaller than player1, transform, get child count, child count. And I want to print the distance. Sphere transform that position and player one transform get child I dot transform that position. So I'm calculating the distance plus a space or a bigger space plus I'm going to skip a row I'm gonna copy this transform that name so let's see how this looks I'm trying to find the detecting the detecting distance which uh, I defined here So console, I'm interested in a, of a minus six one. Let's see. So maybe if I'm here, it should react like almost even from here, something like this. So let's see where is minus six. Hmm. So maybe from here, not really. Okay, so if it's smaller than uh, 0.5 all right let's see how we're going to do that so I, I will keep this at least I will comment and uh, detecting distance it should be 4.5 I think Zero forty-five. 45 nah, actually 0 0.50 it was good uh, uh, as it was, 0 0.5. And now I will need to add some movement here. So I would add precisely this movement here. So if transform Transform that position. No, actually, it's it's this distance that I want to get. A vector free distance is is smaller than the detecting distance. Then you should do that. To have too many of these. Hmm. 
Not sure why I was getting that error. And then do this one here. And the adjustment is going to be other. I'm going to add uh, maybe like 5, 0 0.5, just in case. So let's see how that works. I'm going to control the player from on this one here. Oh, and I need to activate the movement. Control S, let's see if it activated. While in play, yes. So what I'm interested is in how it will react. Okay. Poke. All right, so now we only need a way to control this uh, stick to put it so. And actually, let's modify its rotation as well. And the rotation should be minus rotation factor multiplied with uh, the name of a child. int dot parse name and that's that so let's see how that works i'm going to give it a very high rotation factor at first just to see how it's going okay so i would like it to go like upperish all right it went as expected and we should go like really down but of course i will uh we can modify the rotation factor as we'd like i'm going to leave it to three maybe and uh, let's uh, check again in the middle yes All right, so it seems it's uh, working. We need to do the same thing for player two and then only configure this one should move maybe with WS and the other from the mouse. All right, then I'll see you in the next part and uh, we'll finish it. Hello, welcome to the third part of our video. And I think uh, if everything goes all right, this should be the last part and we should have all the game sets in order for you to configure it further on. So let's see what we need to do. We are initializing the cards here. Also checking for them, so we do have some cards. Now, if I press play, we can see them. I'm actually going to go in 3D mode and see what happens behind this. And let's try and uh, make uh, something happen when we click on them. So let's go and say we would need to use a raycast hit to the hit info. And this would be the same complicated line that we used at uh, the shooting system. So hit info equals to mm, physics 2D. Raycast here camera dot main dot screen to world point. I'm going to skip a row new vector free input mouse position dot x input mouse position dot y zero skipping two parentheses because we only need one vector free. And here, but no. Yes, if actually that would be vector free dot zero. And math f dot infinity. So now, first of all, let's check if it info mm, is not null. Oh, 
and if hit info dot tag no transform dot tag equals to card oops control k control d print one so here we could only say if hit info so i can get rid of that green line over there so i'm clicking on the blue nothing oh actually not when clicking we should do it when clicking so let's place if input dot get mouse button down and do all this up until here now if i would be to remove this if hit info it would not give us an error and here i would write mouse button zero so now when i click and if i hit a card it should print a one precisely it printed one but if i click here clearly it gives us an error because hey i'm not hitting anything that's what he would actually say so that's why if hit info just to get that's not an error but it's good to it's better not to not to see it we don't like that red stuff over there as i did not like that green stuff over here so let's structure it like this so okay we do hit a, a card let's make it turn uh, turnover so we would say hit info dot transform dot rotation equals to quaternion dot zero 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 so this should be yes because we are um where are we no 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 oh in initializing m at uh, minus 180 or 180 it would be the same on y so now each time i click a card it should be rotated but i only want to rotate two cards so i will create a counter public int counter and i would say here if counter is smaller than two yes go ahead and rotate the cards and whenever you rotate a card counter plus plus so we add one to the counter and precisely it doesn't allow me to rotate more more cards now let's add the cards into a list and check if they are the same cards so we will need another list like this but we will call it selected cards and actually let's add a yet a public card and this would be better uh, the card i last clicked and we will delete the counter and i'll tell you in a minute what why we are doing this so i have tested before both ways and with this way with a counter i was giving uh, getting an error let's say for example what we want to achieve here is uh, when we press on two cards so let's say i can see that here we'd have the two guys similar afks so we would like for them to disappear they do have the same id and they would disappear however if we check by id or by counter or by anything 
if they are the same, if they do have the same ID, I could click on the same card two times and it will disappear. So that would be an error. So uh, that's why I am creating uh, a card here. So the last card I click would be this one here. So I will comment this. Actually, I will delete it. And so once I clicked it, I already want the last card I clicked to be that. So the last card I clicked equals, well, a card needs an ID and a game object. We do know that's, uh, that's how the cards are, are what are made of. So we are going to create a function. I'm going to comment this a bit. That is going to receive a game object. Which game object? This hit in for that transform. And it will place it, which is the card piece that we are clicking on at the moment. It will put it through all the list of all cards and it will give us back the corresponding card that carries that game object. So let's do that. Public, it will return a card. So public card, get card by game object and it will receive a game object hit info collider actually let's call it a game object otherwise it so it receives that and it devolves a card and return null Otherwise, but we know in this case that it will never return null. So we will have to do for when all cards dot count, and we will check if hit info collider, which is the same game object, let's call it uh, hit info collider game object equals to the all cards i dot card piece then return all cards i so now I do know that we can get the last card I clicked like this So the last card I clicked equals to get card by game object and we need to give a an game object this one here hit info dot transform dot game object now we do have a list of selected cards so if this card is not added already to the list then we will add it but if it is added it means we already clicked on it so if uh, in a way to to say that if um, selected cards that contains the last card I clicked equals so if it doesn't to false if it doesn't contains it then it should add it selected cards dot add the card I last clicked and so far so good now it will so let's see how that works Selected card is empty. It has ID2 card clone. Okay, nothing happens if I'm clicking on it. I click on the other one, it added it because it is a different card, but I can't click on the same card. So that's good. Now we should also rotate the card now. So the cards I last clicked dot card piece 
dot transform dot rotation equals to quaternion dot Euler zero 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 all right so far so good I saved it yes okay it is working properly now let's check if they are the same cards so if selected cards that count equals to two let's do the following so in the case they are the same if selected cards one zero actually equals equals two and I'm checking their IDs because I know that the cards won't be the same ID so if IDs are the same and I'm for sure that they are different cards I'm not clicking on the same card which would obviously have the same ID what should we do destroy selected cards dot zero dot game no uh, piece card piece no and the same for the other one and very important I'm not going to clear it but if we don't clear it and we always need to uh, pay attention when using lists because sometimes we do need to clear it okay uh, well I wanted to actually check for two of the same guys so I do have this one here and the other one here okay they disappeared but now if I'm going to click again so I clicked on trial here and the other one should be here so they did not disappear why because that's why because we did not clear it so here immediately selected cards dot clear so we destroyed the uh, end with parentheses so that the, the list gets empty and we can reuse it is the same as resetting a timer to zero so it starts again all right so far so good now let's see if the selected cards IDs are different not destroyed but we'll need to rotate it back so we would go selected card zero card base I'm going to delete this dot transform that rotation equals to this but with a, a 180 instead here or minus 180 it would be the same and we will need to do the same for card one so I'm clicking on Jaina here no actually I clicked on trial there I'm clicking two times nothing happens garage nothing happens nothing happens nothing happens now let's get them both they disappeared okay I have an error here and I know what the error is so here we are destroying them and it tells me that it doesn't get an index well the index is for this one because after we destroy and clear the selected cards here it goes and checks again so that's why an else if is better to be used uh, that's not quite an error but yes is, is that red thingy there so going this
okay and so on and it should work well this pretty much is the game now uh, there would be a lot of implementation it could be done and you should do it maybe add uh, using unity engine dot ui and add a console so we to talk and add a counter so when the game starts it should wait maybe and add between two players and their names one on the left one on the right and maybe to be configurable from a menu as we we do have a notion of text canvas and uh, and the pre uh, and the player prefs you could use the same uh, the same way we entered the player's name in uh, in the 2d project and make a lot of use of the text very very useful and add uh, many counters uh, what i would first do i would uh, want the rotation to stay a bit or to be smoother not to rotate immediately so i was thinking of a way to do that but actually and using this so using the constructor that we just made so let me uh try it i have tested a bit but i think we do need a rotate and a rotate back so i copied all that we had in update and i'm going to create a void well void gameplay So I, I do like to test in update and then organize it in functions and uh, get get rid of it. So here, gameplay. It should run in update. Now, what do we need here? So instead of rotating it, so here it would be transform rotate towards zero 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 and this should have okay so let's create a boolean and when it's rotate when it is uh, set to true we should rotate all the cars that have a boolean set to true towards zero 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 So let's do that. Uh, so we will need a speed and here let's do a rotate. Uh, uh, so I'm adding a boolean to the uh, class card. Public bool rotate and not sure if I need it here. Okay, let's add it a rotate bool. And we will equalize it. So rotate equals to rotate. And when we add it, when we initialize it, the rotation should be set to false. But by default, it is set to false. false okay so far so good and here we should set it to true the card I clicked rotate equals to true and here we should set them to false not the card piece but it's rotate property that we just added so one so these are the only cards i am rotating true and false so how would I go about that well in uh, the update for okay uh, all cards 
that count. I think there could be more uh, a variety of ways of doing this, but I'm, I'm going to try this plus. We are going to use a rotate towards. So if all cards i dot rotate equals to true, then do this. And else if equals to false, do this. So if it's true, it should rotate from its current rotation all card sides. We are actually accessing the card space. That's the thing that we want to rotate. But we do have it structured in a class with its ID, with its card piece, and with its Boolean if it should rotate or not. So in update, we are checking this for all the cards. Now, as we do not have a million cards, this shouldn't be very uh, processing power expensive to put it so. So all cards I dot transform dot rotation why why no card space card piece dot transform dot rotation equals let's create a speed public float speed rot equals to quaternion dot rotate towards and it would be its current rotation so what I'm rotating this guy here from its current rotation towards which rotation so if it's set to true I'm rotating it towards quaternion dot Euler zero 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 so this should be pretty easy at what speed rot speed speed rot multiplied with time dot delta time and if it's set to false I am rotating from my current rotation towards 180 here and this should should do it let's place a speed of 100 Oh, it didn't got to rotate that. So maybe in here, when uh, let's uh, create a public float timer. So if a card has been chosen to rotate, it should first rotate before we change that. So how would we say that to it? The problem is uh, is actually when I am clicking the second time. So let's take all these. What do I have copied? Okay, this one here. No. Let's take all these and uh, make another function. Public void. Uh, this is a really quick uh, get out of this situation to put to put it so. Uh, you could find uh, other solutions or maybe change the whole structure of a thing. So public void uh, adjustment, rot adjustment. Adjustment. And here we would use uh, a bool, public bool, adjust. So here adjust equals to true. And in update, I could say if adjust do the following timer plus equals time dot delta time if 
timer is bigger than one second. Adjust rotation adjustment. And then timer equals to zero. And I should not be able to click. And adjust equals to files. And if it not, I shouldn't be able to click, I should put a condition here. And selection selected cards dot count is smaller than two. So one goes right, the second goes right. Okay, so it took around uh, maybe one is a is a very low second. Uh, let's uh, let's place. Uh, so this would be just so we know uh, rotations quick solution timer and timer cap time cap. And here we should use the time cap. In update, okay. The time cap I set to three. Let's press play. And now they are both turning. And I can't click on anything else for the three seconds. Now I, this remained because I clicked on it after they, they just finished. Now let's click on two of the same. So let me something easy. Maybe this one here. No, I thought it was troll. It's garage and it's near. Okay. So far so good. Where is the error? So when I'm destroying it. 64. Okay, so we will say if all cards I dot card piece is different than null, then do all this. And also here, so this is a quick getaway. This, uh, these are the proper the rotations, this would be the adjustment, and this is the gameplay that we did previously. So, this one with this one, no. Okay, they should turn back. Alright. They disappeared immediately. Now I'm clicking, I'm clicking. I'm clicking like this, trying to uh, to look for errors. Okay. Control. No. I want Troll to stay and I'm going to... This one. No, it was that one. Shoot. Okay, well, so now what it would be left for you... Yeah, it would be left, uh, and I think it's, I enjoyed uh, a lot when um, learning, pre uh, playing with, and I do enjoy now playing with text and uh, make a console and um, have it tell me, tell me stuff, uh, like telling me a story, like it would start with uh, w rolling the dices and uh, then add uh, one, uh, one period, then um, after one second another period and, and so on and then the result of the dice is and which players should go first and we'll meet in our next project well that is that
I'll see you in a bit. Hello, welcome to the third chapter of our course. And this will be the chapter when we are, we are going to actually make a game, a 2D complex game, but it's going to be an extended chapter, maybe the most, uh, the largest in the course. So I have prepared an empty project actually, I just created the resources folder, moved the scenes inside and renamed my scene. And I also changed the ambient color to full white. Uh, we will need a canvas at some point, but I'm not creating it now. Let me just control S. Regarding this project, we will uh, face some technicalities and uh, some technical stuff and as well artistic stuff. And for that, we do need assets. Now, I was thinking this time, maybe we should start uh, with the colors first, make it a bit shiny and then test everything we are going to do in our project, in our game. And you should do a game of your choosing as long as it, you can use everything we're going to learn here. In my case, this will be the game I will create and it will be like a tour of all the, all the things we are learning. So that's why I'd like to start with giving it some color and then add functions. Now, how do we get assets? Well, the best way to get assets would be for you to create, to create them yourself. Now, not all of us are artists, uh, but uh, well, some, some of them, yes, do require an artistic inclination, but not all of them. Now, creating assets also requires a lot of time and uh, it, 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 is not, uh, it is not easy to create a good asset. So uh, let me show you, as uh, when I started studying Unity, we were, well, we had to create our own assets, otherwise we would uh, be failing the test. So here it is an example of, uh, of the first game I ever created. And as you can see, it is pretty awful. Just because all the animations uh, were created uh, by, <laughs> by me and everything actually. And uh, yes, well, this uh, pretty much uh, is it. Now, let me show you, we will need uh, animations for our characters. There are many ways to obtain animations. So the first um, time I started, I started uh, with pixel art. With pixel art, well, I have a, this is a goat actually. I have, I spent a lot of time to create those animations. Let them, let me open them in folder. So uh, I created a, a Photoshop project and then I had to work for each and every one of them frames as well for the idle, for the jump, for the running, for the double jump and, uh, and so on. So that is a way to, to create, a, let me, I would like to open it with Photoshop. I'll add it here. I prepared some, some resources for us. So yes, I was actually working with, with uh, pixels and with the uh, pencil tool because this doesn't add to the softness that uh, a brush tool would do. So yes, that's a way to go. Other way, uh, ways to do this, to obtain character animation, are programs such as Spriter, for example. And well, you have a system which is similar to the 3D rigging and you can, um, well, you can uh, create and rig your, your character and do the movement and do the animation. And that is, uh, that gets pretty good results. Now, another way to obtain animations is to create them in Unity. But for that, we will need to import them uh, to create our character in Photoshop or uh, Adobe Illustrator and uh, just segment the character like left arm, right arm or actually it's, it's better to say back arm, the arm which we will not see because it's in the profile or, or not normally see. So back arm, forward arm, back hand, forward hand. So let me see, uh, show you what I'm talking about. I actually got a reference of Stewie and I would like to 
have it as our main character and uh, I have created it in uh, Illustrator with uh, all its corresponding layers. Uh, one solve that. I also created the neck even if we do not see it. It will help because uh, this is like uh, from where the head would pivot the rotation. Uh, another important thing you'd uh, have to keep in mind when you create your your character, they would need to blend, like from where would the leg rotate. So let me just grab the rotate tool. I'm going to pivot it around here. So yes, it, it will need to blend somehow. Well, more, more or less. Uh, I, I chose the wrong, uh, the wrong pivot, but uh, you you will see what I mean once uh, uh, once I will um, uh, I will have them uh, prepared in uh, in uh, Unity. Okay, so uh, this is one thing. Then I exported it to Photoshop, and here, well, it comes in layers, and it is a good thing we can only save it. Save us. We only need to save it as a large document format as PSB and this format we can import it in uh, in Unity but with all its corresponding uh, layers and there we will import some assets which will help us animate them. Now another way of creating uh, animations for Stewie and I had a run at it to let me go on desktop on resources so let's do one let's see this one so yes uh, i have created like really a, sh a really short uh, idol and if you name all your fol folders with uh, their corresponding uh, place number and dot png then you can simply go at file generate and image assets and we'll create this uh, this kind of folder folders with their images inside so yes that's uh, that's kind of it well uh, if you do not have a time to create the animations well I will upload both to this and uh, the PSB file but Let's uh, investigate further on how to create uh, or how to get assets. So I'm going to close everything. I also prepared a cannon for us. All right, it's a bit more. <laughs> I have a bit more RAM now. So other ways to create assets. For example, in uh, 2D, I wanted at some point to create some curtains. So I. Oops, not this one. So I went to 3D to a 3D program, created a curtain with a green screen, and then rendered it. And then found another program that would uh, find a way to frame it. So we could uh, actually make the same as with Idle or as with anything. It will be a, a sprite sweat. It will be a sprite sequence actually. Then another way it is to create a sprite sheet and this would help in, in when we are working with particles. For example, I'm shooting and I'd like to, to have a small flame uh, get from the nozzle. And for that purpose I have prepared like really fast some um, oh yes some um, some sprites and this would be sprite sheets not sprite sequences. Okay, now for the environment, uh, I was uh, suggesting to create a test project. So I entered the, our first 2D project that we created. And let's see first how we export an asset. So I would like to export this rotating bullet. You do only have to go to assets, export package. It will show all its dependencies. And I'll export it on the desktop uh, bullet. And I'll save it, of course, as Unity package or actually in resources for 2D project. And we can see that it already exported it. Now, uh, this would be another way to 
create uh, assets with as I said with a spray sheets and here I would like to have a small fire for the cannon uh, well I doubt this uh, will be very impressive but just for uh, for the sake of it in order to practice you could create your own assets and have them much more beautiful than uh, than I have created them all right so uh, as I was saying I now I only have opened uh, our two projects which one would be the main project and another test project so I have investigated and uh, a way to get assets it, it is the asset store and there are many many free assets so let's uh, you go to asset store if you do not have this tab here I think in window asset store there is a good uh, thing that I do have it actually in my assets so I will go to package manager and one I have added an asset it should appear here in uh, in my assets and the one that I was searching for 2d hand painted so that's the one okay back to searching online oh this is the one which it is free at the moment so anyway we will search for something else so what you'd have to do you'd have to click here you'd have to get this asset and uh, then yes precisely we'll have to allow it and it will get us to the package manager and right here so i would like to import it actually first download it then import it so i will select import and i will ignore what is going to tell me it will require us to install another line render but another rendering pipeline but we are not going to to do that what i'd like for us to do is to browse around and uh, see what we can gather and another way of getting assets would be in our learn tab here you could uh, download all of these and just browse and see what images or sounds you may get and to be able to use so I will ignore all of this because I do not want to to have that so now in assets I should find what I downloaded and uh, in sample in texture what I'm interested it's in these images so I will show in Explorer and I'll copy it one copy them one by one even if I'm not going uh, to use them I'm just showing you how uh, how to do it and here let's create another folder called textures and inside folder set one and just drag them there now okay it's going to take a while while it, while it is importing them okay so a way to get assets is this searching for free assets online also we could browse the beginning projects and there are many many sites that do have bundles and free assets now let me see these are sprites so let me just click on it and it is single well no no actually this would be multiple sprites now we can't really use them at the moment why uh, because if I would be to drag it in our scene it would show me three clouds let's say I only want to show one cloud I would have to go in sprite mode change it to multiple and a sprite editor and I do not have a sprite editor apply okay actually oh I do have a sprite editor so now I could slice it and arrange it 
but we, we are going to do this uh, later on as well and this would be my first cloud cloud for example and I will apply so now if I click on clouds I only have my first cloud actually and I could add more slices for all the clouds same for the objects same for the plants and same for everything so this is a very useful way to to bring color to our to our project uh, what I was going to say okay also in our main project we will need to install something more so I will go again to window package manager packages in unity registry we need a PSD importer well I do have it installed you may not have it installed so yes please please go ahead and install it and we do have a sprite to and the 2d sprite should also be installed and if you'd like to check more and more stuff there is here please go ahead and it a google search would help all right let's uh, find another set of textures set two so i'll go to google chrome unity uh, three textures 2d all right so let's sort it by price from low to high and hmm, these are kind of nice well uh just go ahead and browse uh, please and uh, and pick whatever you like for your project so i'm going to go to this and i'm going to try and add it to my assets and of course i do accept and precisely open it open unity editor mm, but i'm not sure if i wanted to download it in my main project no i will download it in the other project so i'm going to window package manager and i should have a let's refresh it again minimized this would be the one and i'll download it uh, this is why i would like to have a test project because every any errors that we might get from importing assets are going to stay in our test project and we will gather from it only what we need so it downloaded and i'm going to import it yes import and so on now another way and another part of uh, our assets gathering would be the sounds now there is a really nice site that i do like and i think it is called freesound.org yes and this helped me a, lo uh, a lot in the past with gathering with gathering sounds like steps or or anything and of course for all the sites that i showed if you do like them please feel free to to donate if they did help you so while we gather these sounds they are not really perfectly um, or edited to suit our project so for that is a very simple actually the simplest way to edit sounds and i think it's called audacity and it is a free open source cross-platform and it looks like that and uh, it's it is pretty intuitive in order to edit a sound you just need to drag it in here and uh, with C for example you can cut it and then you only need to go to export it as, as you would like it but later on when I will add some sounds I will uh, I will show you what I'm talking about so yes let's see if i manage to import the minimalist thing 
Oh, here it is. Scalable grid prototype materials. Okay. So yes, this would use another line, uh, rendering pipeline. That's precisely, and we can't use it. So yes, it would it would have helped for uh, for us to to investigate a bit more before uh, just downloading something. Uh, anyway, well, these are a few good ways of uh, of getting assets. So I think yes, I think this has been an introduction. So let's uh, let's get to our to our project and rigid bodies. I will not uh, add a, add color for a while now, but soon in in the next videos I will. Okay then, uh, see you in a bit. Goodbye. Hello. So continuing from where we left off after scavenging for assets, uh, I actually went and remade the animations because I I wasn't happy at all with them. I still am not very happy, but they, they should do for for the purpose uh, that I have for them. So uh, let's start our first encounter with the rigid bodies. What are the rigid bodies? Well, both in 2D and in 3D, they are pretty similar, and they are well, they are a helpful tool. It is a class, and it's helpful regarding physics and calculations. It can also be used to program characters and not only when I'm saying character I'm referring to for example vehicles uh, pets animals anything you could imagine now another important thing that they do have is also a collider and they do notice collision and that is very very helpful in uh, in games for example I could put an invisible collider and uh, when you pass through it, you know you have reached uh, a certain checkpoint, or activate an elevator, or turn on a light, or turn off a light. So there is a, an in, an infinity of uses for them. I, imagination is the limit. But let's uh, let's get to it. So uh, previously we were scavenging, as I said, for textures. Now I think I showed you about uh, of a sprites and multiple sprites. Okay, let's say for example I, I will take this sprite now we need to make sure in inspector that the it is set to sprite 2d and ui and the sprite mode in this case should be set to multiple we should press apply and if you have installed the sprite editor now it's pretty easy to well you'd only have to press slice automatic yes the defaults should work and this would be ground zero zero. Perfect. Now, ground one. Okay. Slice this one as well. And this one as well. I'll hit apply. I'll close it. And now, when I press the ground, I can see that I have a variety of grounds all the ones here to choose from. So I can just drag them and place them in my scene. Of course, we would have to be careful with position and, and everything. So having said that, I will prepare a ground for uh, for our test with the rigid bodies. I made sure that the lightning, it's uh, the ambient color is set to full white. So uh, let me import something and I will import this floor or the wall. Yes, I would prefer vowel. In I'll place it in set two. Now uh, I don't want to use this as a sprite, and you'll see why in a in a moment. I will create a quad. Main quad box collider. Why I'm writing all this? Because. Um, You'll see, uh, you can see that I do have a quad. Now, if I would be to add the rigid body component to it, it would not allow me because uh, rigid body 2D doesn't doesn't work with a mesh collider. And by default, quads have mesh colliders. So I will remove this component and add a box collider 2D. And now I should be able to add a, a rigid body. However, I won't just yet. 
I would like to make this my main quad prefab because I'm going to use them a lot. So I'll create another folder called prefabs and I'll take my main quad right in here. Okay, so now I can delete this. I do have a quad and I know it has a box collider on it. Now let's create another quad. Okay, no, no, uh, let's, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, let's uh, make the ground first. So I will zero it and I will scale it on the x axis a hundred times. Okay. And I'll create a folder called materials. Material ground. I'll assign it. And now, what I would actually like to do, but it won't allow me in textures in set two, I would like to use this as a sprite and I will go actually make it a multiple sprite and in sprite editor I will hit apply I would only like to take one row from here okay while well, zero I will hit apply because otherwise it won't save so now uh, I can uh, very well drag it in my scene but if I'd like to apply it to a material and then apply it to the quad so if I'd like to go wall zero and hit it here in albedo well it won't let me why because it won't so if I would like to actually add this one here as a sprite it would let me the whole material but you can see I do get a, a nasty look so what I would like to do, even if I do play with tiling and, and everything, actually I'll make the quad so you can see what's happening. 100 by 100. Okay. So let's see. The tiling is one, one. Okay. Now, if I'm trying to, to tile it some more, it, it would not work. Tiling means repeating it on an axis or on both axes. So now I would need to go right back here and instead of a sprite I would like to use it as a default. And I'll hit apply. That still doesn't fix it. But instead uh, of clamp here I would press repeat. Apply. And now I can, um, I can scale it and uh, use it however I, I would like. I'll set this back to 1. And now I'll only need to play with the tiling until I get a, a result that I would like. And I'm more curious in, in the game view result. Okay, well, I think this should do. Actually, let's make our quad a bit slightly bigger so I can see okay I, I will stop here because otherwise nothing <laughs> will come out of it so this is my quad and as I can see it has a box collider so this would be my ground it is set. I would like it to be. Oh no, at minus four. Yeah, that was that was okay actually. So now, for example, I will create another quad from my prefabs, my main quad. I'll make sure to be on the zero axis, and um, let's give give it a material as well. Color. So this would be my testing quad and to this quad I would if, if I would be pressing play now nothing would happen but let's add the rigid body component to it now the rigid body uh, has a variety of properties 
dynamic it means uh, it will respond it will respond to physics kinematic is it means we can control it via script static it means it's just an object on the scene uh, simulated yes because we need uh, no we won't use automas but you can play with all of these um, linear drag actually just drag for the normal rigid body uh, it's just uh, a friction to put it so and for example if uh, this would be in space and it would have a drag of zero and no gravity no nothing but it would have an initial force it would go always without stopping well this drag makes him stop but it's set to zero and the angular drag is the same but regarding rotations uh, the collision detection well uh, continuous it's more processing uh, power costing and sleepy mode yes it should start awake so it can sense the physics and the interpolation well this helps smooth the, uh, the physics uh, but uh, this should only be used for main characters or so because it is processing uh, power costing and here we do have some constraints and we also have a way to add uh, physical materials which is uh, which treats uh, about bounciness and friction but you'll see in a moment uh, what i mean so now i added the rigid body let's press play actually I, we will uh, use the scene view we can see that it fell let's go some more let's add more rigid bodies so I would like to this one actually I will turn off the rigid body oh no actually I will make this larger duplicate it Control D and I'll set this one here and make it I'll add a constraint to the position to the position I don't want it to move and this one I will scale it on the x-axis now I will copy this again let me see in the inspector and I want this one to be here so I copied it I, I don't want to maintain the now let me in just a second I will set it to zero actually and this as well to zero and this to minus 10 whoops and another copy of it to plus 10 and they do not have any restriction let's see what happens well they fell down now let's for example make this a bit longer I don't mind about the collisions and and all right now whoops I should have told okay and let's take this squad and let's make his mass whoops so <laughs> you do see what's uh, what's happening it does what it says it's a uh, simulating uh, physics now you should try and play uh, make a lot of uh, maybe changes place this and uh, place it like this and see how the quads uh, fell and manifest and okay now another thing I'd like to show you let's uh, get another quad I will remove its mesh collider I'll add a circle collider 2d and rigid body 2d and this would be my main quad okay and let's actually 
make it look like a circle so I'll do, add another color to it I think this I have not used the color and I'll look for circle in the albedo and I'll make it cut out okay so now we do have a main quad as a circle but what I'm interested in it's it's circle collider oh and it actually it fits great and you could just instantiate them and well actually make a make like a puzzle with physics so anything you do it would be good practice just go ahead and practice please and in the next video we are going to see how we can control rigid bodies via script and then we are going to add our first animations the classic ones and after the newer ones which uh, require rigging Okay then, I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye! Hello, so continuing from where, where we left off, I went and... Uh, well, I thought actually, just before we delve into the animations, I think it would be better to... and better structured to play a bit, a bit with a rigid body some more, so we can see how they work. And uh, for that purpose, I went and duplicated uh, the material with the mask, with the circle, and I gave them different colors and uh, I also duplicated the quad circle and uh, I saved them as prefabs but before we are going to use this so I do have one two one two three four five six prefabs so this would be some marbles that we are going to test and play with uh, control s let's I'll hide the ground I'd like to show you a bug that uh, Sometimes it happens both in 3D and in 2D, and it's not going to happen in our game, but it's good to be aware of it. So I'm going to create a script. And it's going to be called um, Movement Rigid Body 2D, RB 2D. Okay, I'm going to delete this and this and that. And I will create a quad. Player, actually. I will zero it. And I will remove this. So, let's add, a, add the movement script. Well, with rigid bodies it is very easy to to move the objects now in update well no we do need a reference to the rigid body so i'm going to say public rigid body 2d body and as you can see it will show in the inspector and if i would actually have a rigid body component i could just drag it here but i like it to to get it in start it's standard procedure so in start we only have to do body, the rigid body 2D component equals transform me myself dot get component and the rigid body. And that's that. Now in order to move we would need a vector 2. But let's use a it, it's the same. Um, body dot velocity equals new vector let's uh, start with two input dot get axis horizontal input dot get axis ah, vertical and let's see what happens we are going to get an error, but I would like for you to see it. I press play. 
precisely. We do not have a rigid body. You probably need to add a rigid body, yes. So I'm going to add a rigid body. And you see, I still haven't assigned it. I could do, I could actually, you know, not, not like this. I would have to drag myself into it in here. But no, I'm going to select it to none. And with that thing that we did in start, it will take the component by itself, precisely. And we can see that it's falling, but at a really slow rate. And it's not because of a gravity, it's because we are telling it. And the vertical input is set to zero, but it's still falling. So we should set the gravity scale set to zero. Uh, so now let's imagine that we are trying to create a space shooter. So we would go straight ahead like this. Now I'm going to press W. I have no speed uh, variable here, so I should be moving one unit per second, precisely. One my CCP, two my CCP. And I'm going to press D and again one unit horizontally. Now the bug I was telling you about, if I'm moving diagonally, I'm not sure if you notice it, but it is going slightly faster. Why? Because he's moving one unit in this direction and one unit in this direction which would give us a diagonal and uh, this would be 1.41 the square root of 2 so that is, is why it's it's faster so a way to avoid that is to create actually a vector 2 but actually this time let's do it with a vector 3 because it's the same both in 2d and in 3d public vector 3 my inputs I did not want it to delete that. Now I'll have to write it all again. Okay. I will copy this. And delete this. So public vector free my inputs. So now my inputs equal new vector free. Hmm. It seems I, I did not copy it. Okay, input that get axis horizontal. And input get axis vertical and a zero. Actually, if we leave it blank, it's going to be a zero by default. Vertical. But I, I will add it, it's good customs. So now we do have the inputs. I would say body dot velocity equals to my inputs. And actually let's add a speed as well. Public float speed oh float. All right. And now we should have precisely the same uh, experience as before. I'm going to set the speed to 10. And I will set the gravity to 0. And I'll press play. Hmm. Very tall. Okay. Wrong spelling. Vertical. Allow me to get a cable out of the way. Okay, very good. Now I now I can type properly. Control S. So, and the speed it is set to ten, but I am not using it nowhere. Anyway, you can see we do get the same error. So I would have to multiply it here, for example, with the speed. And it is better here, and you'll see why in a moment. Okay, zooming out. Let's see. Now we're rolling. But on the diagonal, we're rolling even faster. So, uh, in order to avoid that, even if we would, ha would have used uh, vector2, uh, my inputs equals to itself dot normalized. So what this does, it gets a value of 1 
precisely one in any direction. So we do get the direction from here and then it normalizes it. Yeah, so it says, hey, you're one, you're not 141. And then we multiply it with the speed. If, for example, we wanted the speed only on the horizontal axis and not on the vertical axis, well, we would not get it here because we are normalizing it after. So let me show you what I'm, uh, what I'm talking about. So you need to be aware of, this, uh, of these things. And if you're going uh, to plan a, a similar game, now, for example, it is moving at the same uh, speed in, uh, in all directions. So if you normalize something, if I would not normalize it, I could simply add the speed here. I could, couldn't I? Yes. So now I would only get the speed on the horizontal axis and uh, on the vertical axis I would move very slowly, only one unit. So I'm pressing W as you can see, but uh, on the horizontal axis. Now if I would be to normalize it, I would uh, only get one, u one unit in any of them. The speed multiplication does, uh, doesn't take place. Or actually it does, but then it, it reduces it to, to one. So yes, this is what I wanted to show you. It is a good uh, bug to be aware. However, we are not going to use this. We are going to use gravity. Uh, this we can use. Let me get back and set the scene. So we do have a ground. We do have a player and a gravity scale set to one. I don't need any interpolation. I don't need everything for anything for now. So let's see how are we going to move our player. I would say, uh, well, we could start with body dot velocity equals new vector 2. Let's do it with 2 this time. But we do have a uh, vector 3 my inputs, you know, uh, let's let's do it with vector 2 and uh, we can change it after. Oops, so I will uh, I will start again. I'll say my inputs equals to new vector 2 input dot get axis dot at axis horizontal and now I do not want to get the vertical axis actually because we are not going to move on vertical axis I'm just going to fall and zero but so now how are we going to move our body let's see now actually here I can use the speed multiplied with the speed So now my imp my body dot velocity equals to my inputs, but that's not that's not going to work properly because uh, it always equalizes our y to zero, and he fails, but he fails really really slow. You see, because it he always tries to equalize it. So what we can do instead, it would be to sum this. So body dot velocity plus equals my inputs. And let's see how this works. And I think we're going to get a sliding effect. Whoops, not even because we do not have a collider. So let's add a box collider. Oh no, no, box collider 2D. All right. So now we can see that it fell and whoa, it does move very, very fast on, uh, on the x-axis. Uh, one thing we could do is to set a, a really low velocity speed to 0 0.1. And we can see, yes, it's still dragging around. Uh, now I could actually add a linear drag really huge linear drag and the higher speed 
let's see how that and it kind of stops so this could be a way however I'm, uh, I'm going to press pause let's see other way how we could do it so I would like to add this my inputs yes my inputs equals new vector 2 let's see how this works body dot velocity dot x plus input dot get axis horizontal plus multiplied with speed and here it would be body dot velocity dot y and now body dot velocity equals my inputs let's see how that goes with a really small speed well it is working similar we could increase the drag but no not for now i will i will research for for something better for us or different actually i would like to have a, a lot of control on my character because two is going to be very fast and i would like to change uh, uh, to try and uh, change the position whenever i think actually with a drag it could actually be let's see linear drag and the speed of anyway th this is not the purpose so this would be a very basic uh Oh, oh, that's a well. Now it does respond really quick, T too too fast actually. All right, let's try and see how we. Uh, yeah, drag set to one. No, I, I wanted to see the... Oh, it is set to zero. Let's see. Oh, yes, no, we, we do need the drag. But not very, very high. And I would still want it to respond to my gravity. So I'm going to leave the gravity maybe at 3 or at 4, the drag at 6 and let's make it jump, so gravity 4 linear drag at 6 and the speed at I'm not sure what it was 10 no, still too fast ok, that's more like it speed at 3 and let's give it a if input a jump function jump another way to add force and this is a uh, uh, very useful when uh, for example you're when you're launching a shell or when you're shooting a cannon or just throwing stuff around so it is a uh, body so rigid body that add force and it tells us what we need a vector 2 force or a vector 3 as well would work vector 2 that up because we are not going to change the gravity multiplied with let's make a jump speed jump speed and we can actually add something uh, more but n not uh, not now not at this point but only with this we should be able to jump so i'm going to give it a hundred for example because this should be on get key down on get but get button down it should be no 
I will uh, you will see now if I keep pressing space it will keep uh, getting me up so we are not resetting the jump so get button down only when it was pressed of course I can keep repeating it so we will need to find a, a way to to zero it on ground so we know he's grounded so now let's give it a higher speed now at 500 at least a thousand Okay, now it's starting to jump. 1500. Okay, this is going to how, how it's going to stay. Let's uh, let's do really quickly uh, use of the marbles that I prepared. So I'm going to create... No, I do have a, a quad. And in the next video, we are going to learn to animate the character and then a, a trigger. Actually, I'm going to make this slightly bigger and set at the zero at the tiling so it stays the same. And voila. And so we do have this, this. I'm going to create an empty. I'm selecting them again. And I'm going to call it box. Now this box should be zeroed on the set axis. As everything else. Zero. And inside the box, let's create an instantiator. Insta. From instantiator. And let's place it here. So now, let's create quickly a script, Insta script, and it's, it's going to be a, a simple script just to instantiate the marbles. So, public list game object. I don't need to set it as new because I'm going to initialize it. In, uh, in the inspector and public int count. So what I would like to do in start for i smaller than count and you'll see we are going to get an error as well but not <laughs> not quite now so uh, I'd like to game object new marble equals to instantiate. Let's see what do we instantiate. Well, we will need to uh, let me just uh, comment this so I can see how many marbles do we have. I will drag the script instant script to the instantiator inside the box. And in project in prefabs, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six marbles. So there are simple quads with a circle material to put it so and the circle corridor and with a rigid body is the one that we created in the in the previous video and when I duplicated it I, I explained this already so six and let's drag him here I'm going to start from the last one now okay count let's start at 200 and game object new marble instantiate marbles let's see which one random range so I want one of a of a six marbles that we do have each time for 200 times random range zero and marbles that count so if i decided to add uh, more marbles i can just add them and he will instantiate it just like that so let's see how this goes well they did instantiate it but at the wrong position now let's say game object new marble 
no new marble transform new marble dot transform dot position equals transform dot position so equals the instantiator position and I think we will get an error so I do have 200 loops and I did get an error because they are colliding one with each other and as you can see this is what happens well uh, what we can't do actually is instantiate rigid bodies many many rigid bodies that are colliding with each other so close to one another so for that I'm going to find a way to to tell uh, to tell them to instantiate them uh, separately with a position separate uh, separation so new vector 2 and let's see uh, I have to give it an X I'm going to use also random range it's a very useful function a random range between what between my position transform dot position dot X so I'm telling what the marble position will be it will be the position X minus 5 a random range and form that position that x plus 5 and the y position is going to be another random range between I'm going to skip a row yeah so far so good I think that position that y minus 5 plus 5 and this should solve it in theory yep there you go not sure if here are 200 well I'm not going to count them now but actually I'm I can select them all yeah precisely 200 let's yeah it's all of them Hmm. I wonder if I if I would select uh, two thousand in start in one go. Well, well, this should probably really slow my computer or give an error when it's calculating. And yes, I think it will give an error. So yeah, that's why we need to be careful with uh, over instantiating stuff. Alright then, I will see you in the next video where we will start animating our character and uh, see how uh, we can apply the best movement for it. And also using colliders to, for example, move this here and uh, make them drop. There you go, all sold. Well, see you in the next video, goodbye. Hi there! Congratulations on completing this free 8-hour Unity 2D Essentials course. It's an incredible achievement and I hope that you have enjoyed it. You are now ready to get started on your journey of creating some great 2D games. If you would like to uncover all the hidden tips and tricks of working with Unity and creating 2D games, head over to Skilladimia.com. The beginner to advanced course consists of many more hours of explanations, exercises, demos and projects which will turn you into a pro in no time. You'll be able to learn all about 2D game creation and mobile game design, all while working on different projects together with the instructor. If this sounds like something you like, go check it out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.